Alrighty, and we're on. Brilliant. So uh, I'm sitting here today with John Lua. We we're just talking about the pronunciation, right? So it's spelled L-U-H-R. Yep. And uh, the background of that surname you're saying, like, so Lerman would be like the yeah, German like the equivalent. German one. So Lerman is like you know Baz Lerman. Yeah. Um, te- technically, he's related to me somehow. Really? Um, yeah, I don't know. You'd have to ask my dad. He's the keeper of the family tree. <laughs> so Lerman is the German one, and Lua is like the more Scandinavian uh, Viking. Um, Different, like Norway or something like that. Um, Nordic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why I go for the Viking look, man. Yeah, yeah. You got the, like the beard going yeah. and the, it's like the, what, I don't know, what is that kind of a haircut? That's the John haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my son, he had a haircut uh, years and years ago um, and he, he competed with it in Bot- uh, Byron Bay or something and then he posted a, a clip on Reddit and it became like the number one hot trending clip on Reddit but it was like Battle of the Mullets and okay. I really liked his haircut so I, I copied it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so normally I like fully go triple zero on the sides, yep. um, get the mohawk and then everything at the back stays long <laughs> all the time and every time I meet with someone they're like, what's with your hair? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's probably like a, a little bit um, uh, deceiving, right? Because like here you are, you're, you're managing, you know, this, this almost like a software kind of a company. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, you know, John's a bit out there, isn't he? Yeah. Like, is that what people think? Yeah, absolutely. I've had quite a few people just go, this, like, you know, I can tell when I walk into a meeting with meet with clients, they look at me and go like, this is the guy that's going to manage my $200,000 project. <laughs> um, but then as soon as I start talking, you know, I'm so so good at what I do. Um, yeah. That's kind of the conversion, actually. Yep. Because um, what we try to educate people is you want experts working on your technology and marketing. Yep. So when I do the when I start talking, it, it's, it clears up the okay. The guy's hair's weird, but he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you actually legit. You know what you. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's always a good thing because in in that sense, it's like the old saying. You know, you never judge a book by its cover. Exactly. Right. Um, I used to be fully professional. I've actually had one time years ago when we first started at my um, parent company, DigiGround. I would just wear jeans and a t-shirt, and I walked into a room once. The uh, our sales manager at the time had organised a meeting. And the guy, like, actually looked me up and down, like, horrified. He was dressed in, like, the three-piece suit and all this kind of thing, like, full to the nines. Like, his um, business was renting yachts to millionaires and billionaires. Mm. And then he took one look at me and went, um, no. And then we lost that contract. Like, they weren't interested really? in work. Yeah. And I said to the um, BDM then, like, you got to tell me in advance. I can, I can scrub up nice. Yeah. Um, and I started to look more professionally. But then he even told me that guy... That doesn't work for us anymore. But he told me, don't worry about that. Find better clients. Mm-hmm. If they think like that, you're always going to have a problem with the client anyway. Yeah. Um, if they think that just because you're wearing jeans and a T-shirt, you can't build an app, then they're, they're never going to be a good client. Yeah. So I, I learned, took that to heart and for the past six years. That's how we've been thinking rather. We're hiring the clients. They're not hiring us. Yep. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective, you know. Uh, and I guess why I think that's interesting is because, you know, um, sp- to speaking to my own background in, in car sales, right? Like I've worked for guys that were very uh, strict in terms of, you know, how you should dress, especially, you know, when you go to say like a, a luxury brand and people yeah. expect you to be in suit and tie. And, you know, I think in Australia, the, the tie is sort of, you know, it, it's slowly becoming a little bit of a, a phased out kind of a thing. Like I don't think we're at the point where, you know, you'd probably, if you're buying a luxury item, you would probably wouldn't be happy going into a dealership and dealing with someone that, you know, just didn't dress nicely at all. They had the funny hair. Yeah, that, that might put a few people off. But at the same time, I, you know, I think um, once you actually, yeah, once you start talking to people, it does disarm them. And considering that a lot of the times you're trying to set appointments via the phone or internet before you actually meet that person, um, it's pretty interesting, you know, the sort of uh, reactions that you get. You know, like I always talk about this one experience uh, when I – and. Yeah, I was just, uh, there was a guy, there's a guy in this office here. So shout out to Julian. Thank you for letting us use this office space here at Loan Options. Uh, but one of the guys that uh, is in the office here is actually, you know, um, he, he knows me from years ago in the automotive industry. And um, I guess, you know, the, what I was saying there was that um, when I was at that business in Castle Holden, you know, I was this Asian guy running this Holden dealership. And, you know, I was very hands-on with the customers as well. And I booked this appointment with this guy to come in and look at, you know, whatever Holden it was at the time, probably Commodore. <laughs> and he's and he's come in and he's, and he's gone to reception. And I, I've seen the car drive in. And um, so I sort of knew that he was probably going to ask for me. So I, I was just waiting beside him at rece- – like, walk, I walked up to the reception counter just to see who he was looking for so I could greet him. And he ge- he said, I'm looking for Johnny. And I said, yes, that's me, sir. You know, how how are you going? And, you know, very professional. And he goes, you're not a Johnny. 
<laughs> and it was like this really backhanded kind of compliment, right? Like I guess it's a compliment in the sense that um, the way that I speak obviously connected with him and he felt like, you know, he had a good connection with me. But the backhanded part was like, it's like, you know, you're fucking Asian. You're yeah. not, <laughs> you know, you, Johnny, I expect, Johnny's I expect, an Aussie, mate. <laughs> I, I, I expected this white guy, right? So, but um, let's, let's sort of bring it all back. And I, I do want to obviously talk about, you know, the different businesses that you're involved yep. with now. But um, to give people a bit of an understanding of, of uh, who you are and, and what you've sort of been to to get, get been through to get to this stage of, of life, um, where did you grow up? And um, what was like you know you mentioned a brother before when we were just sort of talking. So I guess you know what was your sort of family dynamics at home? Yeah, so it's actually quite funny. I tell this to everyone whenever they ask where you, where did I grow up because I have three kids, right? So um, when my I have a son with like my ex partner um is 22 years old 21 years old something like that um and when my younger son was born who's now nine my my wife and i you know we got one of those books that everybody gets the books like write all the the milestones you know the first teeth and stuff like that and on the page that is like where did you grow up my wife wrote um cabramatta and campsie mm -hmm. that was it i had to attach another like a4 sheet of paper for where i grew up because i moved so many times in my life from the time i was like even young so, um, like, you know, I did kindergarten in Campbelltown, um, living in, like, a housing commission, and then did years one to three in uh, Guildford, like, we moved to Guildford, and then moved to Wollongong uh, after that for three years, then I moved to Summer Hill, then I moved to um, uh, Croydon Park, and this was all before high school. Wow. So, that's a lot of moves in, like, a, a you know, when I was young, and then... When I got older and like finished in high school, um, like when I was sixteen, I was terror, terror, like absolute terror. My mom, I would live with my mom, and she kind of sent me to live with my dad because I was so bad. Wow. Um, and I continued that vein. Like I was at my dad's house for two years before I left, and then while I was in my young adult life, I moved to like twenty different houses, mm. just every few few months. I think the longest stay I had before I I entered my relationship with my wife was um, uh, one year in a specific location. Yeah. So, yeah, like my whole upbringing is, is quite varied. Um, cause my mum was a teacher. Uh, she's still in education, but she was a high school teacher and moved to a lot of different schools. Mm. So it's hard to say, like, where did I grow up? Because I grew up everywhere. Yeah. So so what was the, uh, I guess, the reasoning behind all the different places? Like, I guess, was that, uh, so you mentioned, you know, you grew up in the housing commission first and then did, like, your, your mum manage to find another place and that's why you guys would move? Yeah, or? so when, because um, when, we, when we lived in Campbelltown, Claymore, actually, um, we were in the Housing Commission. My mum was a student teacher. Mm. And, um, yeah, I did kindergarten at Claymore Public School. And mm. my mum also did her, like, prac there. Yep. And as soon as she finished, it was like she finally got a job because um, she was still at uni while we were young. Because she had, like, my older... I have an older sister who's four years older than me, an older brother who's two years older than me yep. and actually a younger sister is 12 years younger oh, than me. Oh, four of you guys? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, and so she had us quite young. Yeah. And so she, then she finished university when I was uh, basically five or six, mm. or entering kindergarten. And then mm. after kindergarten, she actually got a job, um, I think, at Fairfield, Fairfield High School. Yep. And um, that's why we moved to Guildford. Okay. Um, and then it became about that. So then she got a job at Edmund Rice College in Wollongong. So we moved to Wollongong. Oh, so it was all the time was just moving to follow where she would... Yeah, get and that's actually jobs. like 30, 35 years ago. Um, that actually happened a lot with teachers mm. um, because teachers had to be less skilled mm. uh, actually in the olden days. Now now they want like double degrees and you actually have to have a degree in the, t the thing you're teaching, which of course is good. But in the olden days, it would be like, you just have to had to have a bachelor of education, mm. um, and you know, like my metalwork teacher in high school was just a mechanic that also had did a six week teaching course, and he was a high school teacher. Yeah, uh, they don't like that anymore because it's not good education. But te pe teachers like my mum, who had like multiple degrees or like actual proper degrees, were highly sought after mm. and could get good jobs, like or be get better job offers. So we'd just move to where the best work was. Yep, um, and of course, you know, there was three. That was when there was only three of us. We'd have to follow up. My mum and dad weren't together. Um, my dad basically stayed in Sydney my whole life. Wow. And he'd, you know, come and pick us up for the weekends and stuff. Okay. Um, take us to the zoo. I, I went to the zoo about 500 times when <laughs> I was a kid. <laughs> <With your dad. laughs> yeah. So do, do you know the reasoning why your parents um, separated? Or? I, I think it's just like um, from, from what I understand, I don't really know. I, I'm not like, you know, up on the full history of our family because all the way back to like, 
convict time, the Lua family is quite strange, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really weird. Like, my dad always says, my, I think my great-grandfather, because we were in Australia, he went back to England to pick up a cousin to marry. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I think it was just, um, yeah, because they were at uni together and, my, you know, my mum got pregnant and it was the 70s, so you got married when you got pregnant and yep. it wasn't ever meant to be kind of thing. So, yep. they just fell out of, like... <laughs> yeah, you know, um, that that's my understanding of it. Uh, I never actually asked my mom or my dad. Yeah, I should actually ask my dad. He'd tell me. Yeah, but well, that that's, was a, that's a nice little prompter for you. You know, like yeah. if, if you, it's one of those things. Like, I think a lot of the times uh, there are people that you know, you get to this point in life where you do have questions, and then you're either fortunate or not fortunate enough to be able to ask those questions. Yeah, definitely. Right. Like I know my sister because my sister and my mum, my older sister and my mum, voice seem to be much closer than like say. So like I said, I was like a mad little shit when I was young. I was yeah. terrible, like um, always playing up, always in trouble. I left school, like I actually didn't leave school. I just stopped going to school in year eight. Yeah, I would just skip school literally every day. I held a record for the most missed classes at <laughs> Ashfield Boys <laughs> High School. Um, and so my mum and my sister were much closer. My sister knows a lot more than I do, my yep. older sister. Um, but now I'm a lot closer with my dad. Okay. Um, so I, I'm gonna fully gonna ask him. What do you say to him? I was on Johnny's podcast. And yeah, <laughs> he asked me this question. I didn't know the answer. Um, but yeah, it was it was kind of like that was it. We'd move around everywhere, and it, it was good and bad. Like, you know, I I can remember all of the friends I had, but they're not friends anymore. I literally know none of them now. You know, from yeah. from my youth. Yeah. Um, my oldest friend now I went to high school with when I when I moved with my dad and I was at um we lived at Bellevue Hill. Mm. I went to Dover Heights High School and like seriously, I only lasted one year before I just stopped going again. Yeah. Um, like my best friend Seth, shout out to Seth. I met him at high school. Yeah. And I actually have like a di- I used to keep a diary. Yeah. I, I have a diary one on the day I met him. It was like February the fourteenth or something, nineteen ninety six. Yeah. Um, but you know, then That's I have cool. like some of my other friends, some of my friends who who had more stable locations. They have friends from primary school. Yeah. And my wife like. So my wife, all of her friends, because like I said, she only lived in Cabramatta and Campsie, all of her, she knows all of her friends from school. Yeah. Um, she's from a massive family and has like a hundred cousins and they're mainly her main friends, but she still has friends from school and not just friends from school, friends from school that they refer to each other as cousins and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like a little bit weird for me because I, like I have this one friend that I've known for a very, like, yes. 30, almost 30 years or whatever. Yeah. But all my other friends that I have in life, are, a lot of them are from jiu-jitsu, mm. which I've only started six years ago. Yeah. Because I spent so often, like, moving around and, like, basically ditching friends. Yep. Um, yeah. So then uh, I'm a little bit curious about, um, you know, in, in the household. Like, so when you were young, right? So there was four of you guys. Of, like, the yeah, four so when I turned 12, um, so for most of up until I was around, yeah, 12, I'm pretty sure she's 12 years younger than me. I'm terrible with ages and dates, yep. uh, dates of birth. Um, that's what Facebook's for. But, um, <laughs> yeah, there was my older sister who's four years older um, and my brother, older brother, who's one actually one and a half years older yep. and then me, so for most of our life. And then my mum uh, got together with a new partner and had another baby, which is my younger sister, who's, man, serious, I'm so bad. Yeah, Because my daughter is, I call her the keeper of the age chronicles and I can ask my daughter, she's seven or eight. I guess, and I she know knows how to recite everybody's she ages. She knows everything, age and ba- date of birth. Yeah, wow. So that's what I normally do. People ask, like, you know, how old is your sister Sian? I'll be like, hold on, Charlotte, how old is Sian? Yeah, <laughs> yeah wow. Um, so, yeah, for most of my life, it was uh, us. The three of you guys. Yeah, and yeah. I was the baby. So this is one of the reasons why I think I played up a lot and got really bad. Mm. Um, I was the baby and I had all the attention because I was the baby. Then my little sister came in who was literally a baby. Mm. And all the attention moved to her, so I, I created, the, I started to play up. Create drama. Yeah, I just created a lot of drama, like skipping school, um, uh, stealing, breaking into places, things like that. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, after four years, five years, when I was when I was 15, uh, my mum fully was like, I just can't control him anymore. Yeah. He sent me to live with my dad. What, what, um, what sort of stuff did you try and steal? Just anything, man. It didn't matter. Yeah. Seriously, like I got done for shoplifting um, a, a starter cap. Starter cap, yeah. But I had like thirty of them already that I'd already stolen. But <laughs> I was just <laughs> so what was what was your method? We and I'm not I'm not we're not condoning this yeah. behaviour, right? But it's just always interesting to talk about this because I'll share a story after I, I hear it yours. Was, it was just confidence, man. Like, so yeah, again, don't don't do this, kids. Don't steal. Um, 
I would just walk into any shop and whatever I wanted, I would just take it off the shelf and put it in my pocket if it fit or just walk out with it. That, yeah. that was it, like, yeah. you know. And there was at one point where um, in when I was at Asheville Boys, I actually ran a business where people would give me a list of things they'd want and it'd be like, you know, caps or, or Posca pens or spray paint or whatever. And I would just bring it back to them on Monday and get like 10 bucks for a, a starter cap. Wow. Um, yeah, that, that was my... That you, had was my a racket, you had a, actually yeah. had a racket going. Yeah. Um, I hope no police are listening to this. <laughs> Look, sure um, statute of limitations. limitations yeah, 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 you're sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's anecdotal. It's a potential, you know, uh, what's that? You know, memory's a bit fuzzy. Maybe yeah. it happened this way. Maybe it didn't. So <laughs> Find the store that I stole it from. I don't know if they exist anymore. But yeah, that, that was it. Like, it'd be like all through the week. And I have a massive list sometimes, like of mm. 20 or 30 things. And then on Saturday, I just leave at like nine in the morning from home and just go to like Ashfield shops, Burwood shops. And I'd walk, I was living at Croydon Park and I'd walk to Ashfield shops, tell my mum I was with my friends when I wasn't and then just steal stuff mm. and then go and leave it hidden. I had a place at Ashfield Boys that I would leave it all hidden in bags and then on, yeah, come Monday morning, be like, all right, man, you wanted a cap, you wanted a spray paint can. Uh, one time I stole, um, the things that were really popular were the, the starter ignitions from barbecues because yep. you could use them to click on um, video games video and get games. free credits. Yeah. So I had to get heaps of them and then came out, started to remove them from their demo models. Yep. Um, so then I found that if you get an electric lighter and you break it in the right way, you can actually do Use the same, the same thing. Yeah. So I was stealing lots of lighters after that, like heaps of them. Yeah. Um, Isn't it funny, the, the video game thing, because, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a thing. People used to try and use that to, to click, the, to get credits on the video game yeah. machines. And then I think after a while, the machines, they started having the plastic coin housings as opposed yeah. to the metal ones to avoid that. Yeah. But it's, just, it's, it's such a... I don't know when you think about it. It's like, it's crazy how simple these things were, right? Yeah, and so there's a lot of things about it, right? Because when they started to do that, I was a mad expert at this. I even, I got caught once with a clicker and walked out. Like the, the shop owner kicked me out, but then I just took another one out of my pocket and went to the next place. Yeah. Um, and so they put they put it over the coin housings, but all you were trying to do was do like an electrical shock through the, the thing. It didn't matter how. And so you could then go and find all the different bolts and you would eventually find one that would actually work. Really? Yeah, and one of the other things you can do with those old school machines is turn them off and on really quickly at the PowerPoint, yeah. and it would clock up with like 10 credits. Really? So yeah, that was, that was like it was like misspent youth. That's what I would do. I would find a place. At um, Summerhill Video Store, they had a Street Fighter II machine, okay, yep. and I could, I could clock that up like thousands of credits and be there all day yep. um, just by turning the machine off and on. Um, and then, yeah, they st actually started to put like little plastic rubber things over the screws because they would work it out. But still, they could never stop me from turning it off and turning it on. Yep. I got banned from there as well because they caught me. They put a video camera up. And they could see that you, <laughs> you would, how you're getting all these credits because yeah. they're like, oh, we should be making millions out yeah. of this. Machine. And they opened the gate and it was like, hey, there's no coins in here. <laughs> <laughs> but why has this kid been there for like four hours yeah. and there's, there's zero dollars in the machine? So, yeah, yeah it was um, misspent use, man. Yeah. It's funny. Um, my my parents we they actually had a an arcade machine out the front of their their shop, and so you know I used to like they wouldn't give me any money to go and play on it. Of course not. Um, but you know I used to because I was always at the shop. I would I would just you know watch the people that would play, and then occasionally you know I might get lucky and there might be a credit in there or something like that. And um, but it was a lot of yeah a lot of opportunities to play um, Street Fighter and. Uh, Rampage, you oh know, yeah, the one where the yeah, you, you, yeah. you pick like wherever you're Godzilla or whatever and you're smashing the buildings. Um, so those sorts of games. But um, actually, like one time when I when I did actually was, al was allowed to play the machine, I was so engrossed in playing it that I, I actually had been bitten by a spider. Oh my like God. It was cr crawling up my leg and like you know, you're playing the game, you don't think about it. I thought it was a fly and I kept stomping my leg to try and shake this fly off and it was a spider and it kept biting me. And it was only a baby, like it was like a little, I don't know, say like a smaller than a five cent coin. And like, I, I tell this story just because it's a bit of a reflection on my dad, because uh, after that, I went into my dad, it was a little yellow and black spider. I still remember it to this day. And it probably, I don't know how many times it bit me, but like it was on my leg for a while as I was playing this game. And it was only like in between, you know, like when I was doing like one of those cut scenes or something and I'm looking down at my leg and I realized it was spider and I brushed it off and I kept playing. And then after I went in and I said to my dad, dad, I think I've been bitten by a spider. And he, go, and he just sort of looked at me and he just said, oh, just sit on that chair over there, right? And, I, and so I'm like sitting on this chair. Then I like had this massive headache and I felt like I'm, I think I'm dying or something like that. This, this is the memory that I have. And then my dad was just like, ah, oh, you'll be fine. And I, he never sent me anywhere and eventually I got better. Like I just, you know, probably lay there for like four or five hours and, then, and he was probably like, oh, it's good. He's, he's, he's passed so out. Old school parent mentality. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be right. Yeah. Stop your engine. So, yeah. So like I remember that feeling of like, you know, 
like I have this hole in my head from whatever it was. Yeah, man. Video I don't know what kind of a spider it was, but anyway. Video games are a massive danger for kids. And, you know, I've, again, I've done like, spent heaps, of, I've sunk heaps of time in video games in my life as well. I don't play anymore. I just can't get into them anymore. Jiu-Jitsu has ruined my life, I think. You I, reckon? This, yeah. I, I, I can still fixate on a video game. I totally can. I can can't. fixate on almost anything that I find interesting. But I can, I can watch a lot of TV shows. That's the thing. Like, I've moved from video games to TV shows, which is terrible because I've watched get some garbage TV shows. Like <laughs> absolute garbage just to have something on. Yep. Um, but I always tell, like, you know, I always say to people, video games are an appetite um, toilet and uh, pain suppressant. Mm. So while you're playing, you don't need to pee, you don't need to eat, yep. and you, you'll miss out on feeling like spider bites. Yeah. Um, when, when I used to play DC Universe Online, I was massively into that. I probably put like 20,000 hours into it. I had a website. It was the most successful DC Universe Online website huh. um, in the world. My brother and I did all the content. I had like 100,000 visitors a month. The, the creators were tweeting it out. So when people would ask questions, the developers, Sony would tweet out, go to this website to get your questions answered. Yep. And they would reset servers at 3 p.m. And um, my brother works at Australia Post and he very, has really weird holidays. But we just had this perfect storm where I had holidays, my son Jordan had holidays, and my brother Brian had holidays all at the same time. So I would take two televisions and uh, PlayStations to my brother's house at 7 in the morning every day. Wow. And we would play, and at 3 p.m. when the server would reset, all of us would need to use the toilet. All of us were really hungry. Sometimes, like, my son Jordan would be like, oh, my leg's dead and couldn't walk and yep. stuff like that. And it's like, but for those, like, eight hours, yep. we, we could feel nothing. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, my wife always asked me, because my son Alex, my nine-year-old, he's fully into Roblox, which disgusts me. Um, <laughs> she always says, like, you know, if he wakes up in the morning, she'll be like, why isn't he eating? I'm like, because he's on the video games. They're yep. an appetite suppressant. She's like, he hasn't even been out of his room to go to the toilet. Again, he doesn't need to pee until yeah, the video game stops. Away. Yep. So, so oh, I guess we're digressing a bit here in terms of the timeline, but I'm curious, like, you know, do you have to set some guardrails with your kids about that? Yes and no. Um, what, what I kind of find is people will tell you this, like, you know, like Matt Walsh will talk about how he doesn't have um, screens. After, screens yep. And, you know, the people have these times where you've got to do it. But I find it's more of an understanding thing, right? I understand the video games and I have these rules with my son where, like, I even had it this morning where if you're going to have a tantrum and cry over video games, then you can't play video games. Yep. If you understand that they're video games and they're just something you can do, I, I'm not really 100% fussed if he's going to spend like five hours or six hours on a Saturday playing video games. Mm. As long as when I go, all right, man, we've got to go to jujitsu jitsu now. Yep. He's like, okay, cool. Tells his friends, all right, got to go to jujitsu jitsu now. Turns off yeah. the iPad and then puts his clothes on and we go to jujitsu. jitsu yep. um, Yeah, because I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I like to say I'm progressive about it, but... Th- I don't see any difference between like if a kid wants to just read a book for 10 hours or play a video game for 10 hours. Yep. What I don't like is if my son is sitting in his room playing video games by himself mm. just for like an extended period of time because he plays with friends. Yeah. That's that's one of the great things. That's what I mean when I mean I'm, what I'm talking about understanding. I understand that he's actually doing something pretty social. Yep. I can hear him screaming at his friends about how they're such noobs yep. all day. Yeah. So he's talking to his friends and I hear some of the conversations they have and stuff like that and it's like funny to me. Um, they try to have like these philosophical conversations but they're nine years old. <laughs> and so I'm okay with it. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, if if he has tantrums about it, mm. if it's like, all right, no more video games, we're going to have dinner or whatever and there's a big tantrum, then it's like, all right, no gotta more, we gotta, it. yeah, we've got to put some limits on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and he, when I was young, I, I remember playing, like, you know, to progress into the same, but it leads to the same thing. My brother and I were playing Monkey Island on Commodore 64. Hey. Um, and my mum wanted us to do the dishes. Yeah. And she said, when you die, do the dishes. She was trying to be nice, mm. but we were like little shits. You can't die in Monkey Island. Yeah. There's so only one died. way to die. Yeah. Yeah. And then she came back like two hours later and said, why haven't you done the dishes? And we were like, oh, you said you when you die. Yeah, you haven't died yet. And, you know, because video games were kind of, Newish, she didn't have that understanding. Yeah. So when I go to my son, I go like, "When you die, you got to do the dishes." If he giggles, we're like, "Can you die in that game?" All right. If you can't die in that game, it's <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he's smart. He's yeah. smart. Yeah. You, you clocked like, onto. All right. All right. Sorry. I'll do the dishes. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Ten minutes then. Like if he's if he's really quick quick to say like, "Yeah, that's fine." Yeah. Then then it's like, like maybe mm, you can't die. Yeah, that's right. Maybe he's playing Minecraft in creative mode or something where you just can't die. Yeah. So then I'll go, what are you playing? How long does it take to die? What's the, the time period here? Let's work out a time period instead. Those are the limits I like to impose. Yeah. Um, and I, But I can totally understand where other people 
have their own limits. Mm. You know, I, I don't I don't think anybody is wrong about it. I don't think there's enough, you know, research actually and, and enough mass market kind of understanding of it for there to be a right or wrong answer. Mm. You know, there's a right or wrong answer and um, whether or not you should let a nine-year-old play with a gun. Yeah. But there's no right or wrong answer just yet and whether on whether how long you should let a kid play with video games as opposed to re- even reading books. Yeah, well, it's when you think about the, the books thing, like every parent would love their kid to read more books, but it depends on what kind of books they're reading. Exactly. Right? You so... Know. If with with anything, there's that um, you you got to have that uh, sort of care factor in terms of okay, like is this knowledge actually something that's appropriate for their level? Probably that's one thing that you got to think about. Uh, same thing with the video games. You know, is this is this video game actually suitable for yeah. you know a nine year old to play kind of a thing? And then it's like okay, um, you know, books are very powerful in the sense that especially if, if for somebody who likes to read, uh, like I, I so for me, I can I can fixate on almost anything so like if like uh, as an example um i went down the the rabbit hole of trying to catch up on all the reread the dune series of books oh god right that, that's an investment man that's an investment but like when i get into a book like i, I can i finish like one of the books in maybe less than a week because i just read it in all of my spare time yeah you know and so it'll be like um you know or there'd be zero social media time like for that week i'm not using instagram i'm not using anything social i'm just literally like reading reading this book I go to the toilet instead of being on socials i'm reading a book you know, before bed, I'm reading, you know, probably another 100 pages before I go to bed. Uh, I wake up in the morning, everybody's still asleep, bust out the book, book, yeah, right? Um, I could be, you know, ma- uh, making food for the kids and, and reading this book. That's how fixated I could get. But I think I've always had that trait because, you know, to go back onto your thing about um, watching television series, like this is, and this is really bad, like when I think back on it, but like, uh, you know, I used to get um, into uh, like, yeah, drama series or things like that and... Um, I would watch, like, so back then, you know, when I was watching them, you used to watch them on DVDs because you didn't have, it wasn't, yep. you weren't streaming yet, right? But if, if I got my hands on a series that, you know, I, I could get into, the moment I, g- I had, like, my own little computer in the room with a, with a DVD player, I was, like, you know, in bed, lying on my side, have the laptop on its side and just watching, right? And, you know, for me, it's like, you know, you just like, oh, I'll just, you know, watch one episode. But then it's like, oh, it's a cliffhanger. I've got to watch one more. Before you know it, it's 4 a.m., and yeah. you, you've watched seven of the episodes and this thing is like an investment. It's just like reading books, right? It's like 40 episodes long and each episode is an hour. Like that's a lot of time. Exactly. Right? 44 hours of your life and you and all you're doing is you're sacrificing sleep for it. In the, see, that's why I don't have any real issue with video games. I find them all to be the same. Look, I've, I've done the same with television shows on DVD. Yeah. One one birthday I got um, uh, Baywatch yep. for my, um, my birthday. Um Again, I've watched some terrible TV shows, but I accidentally, without realizing, binge watched the entire first season of Baywatch yep. on DVD. Yep. You know, it's twenty four episodes, yep. <laughs> forty minutes each, um, in my bedroom. And my mum came in and was like, "Have you been, have you moved?" Mm. I was like, "Why? What time is it?" She's like, it, "It's it's midday, and mm. you started at eight pm last night." You know, I'm like, "Yeah, like that, that's that's always the danger as well, though, as a parent." Like mm. my I'm. There was a period of time when my kids, both my kids, my son and my daughter, wanted to stay up all night. And my wife was adamantly against it. Yep. And at the beginning, I was adamantly against it. But it became like a thing, like a challenge. And so I said to them, okay, mm-hmm. let's do it. Stay up all night. See how you go. But if you're angry in the morning, grumpy in the morning, because you've got to wake up at the same time anyway. Yep. It was on a weekend. I'm not going to do it on school. Yep. Actually, during school holidays. If you're grumpy and you act like an idiot during the day, we've learned that you can't handle the responsibility of staying up. Yeah. First night was really funny. Like, my son was adamant he was going to be the one to stay up, but my daughter did. I came in at 7 in the morning. My daughter was sitting there. Um, she plays with Barbies more than watches her tablet and stuff. So I was like, cool. And then my son was upset because he had fallen asleep and didn't make it. So he he bargained with me and said, can I try again? I was like, oh, I'll try again. <laughs> but, it, again, if you're an idiot, if you act all grumpy, if you don't do what you've got to do, it's it's off. It's yep. off the table. And then the next day, he, he managed to do it. I came at 7 a.m. I was like, how do you feel? And I was like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you gave them the lesson, right? Yeah. They, they had to learn that lesson for themselves. But I also think, um, you know, just going back to the point about, you know, the video games and things like that, is that uh, to sort of discredit them and say that there's no learning in doing those things and they're, they're just purely wastes of time. You know, if, if you're playing a, like an RPG-style game where you have to do a bit of, re- like, there's things that are popping up on screen that you've got to read the text boxes or you've got to listen to what people are saying... Like, there's, there's things that you actually learn from that. Yep. And um, as much as, like, you know, when you watch um, TV shows and things like that, it's 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 a bit of art imitating life. Uh, I actually believe that I learn a lot in terms of how to read people 
based on shows, like watching dra- these drama series and things like that, you know, in terms of, you know, you sort of get to see, depending on what kind of a show it is, like how bad people can get. Yep. Um, and likewise, how good people can be. And, and uh, you know, I guess typically in those stories, there's always a good and a bad person to make it easier for the, for the reader or the, or the viewer to understand. But, you know, if you just, you can't just go away and say, and discredit and say there's absolutely no value in that. You might actually just learn that it's a waste of time, that particular show that you watched. Definitely. Right? But there's always a value in, in, you, in learning against any of those things, right? You know, as part of like my, when I'm talking to a client who wants to develop an app, I yeah. actually have a list of shows that I suggest they watch. Yeah. I tell them always go watch Silicon Valley. Okay. Because um, it's funny because the Silicon Valley is a comedy. It's written by a bunch of um, tech journalists, though, who mm. worked in the industry as well. I think one of them worked at HubSpot for a while as a content creator <laughs> and stuff. Um, I've literally had conversations in my office about apps that happened in Silicon Valley. Yep. It's, it's, it's bizarre. Like, wow. I'll have these exact same conversations. In Silicon Valley, it's much funnier. Yep. With me, it's frustrating. Um, um, I also tell them to watch that um, We Crashed TV show with Jared Leto. And, um, I haven't seen that one. No. Uh, it's about WeWork. Okay. So WeWork pitched itself as a technology company when really it was a real estate company mm. and went through all this nonsense where – because one of the things about it um, is – like in technology companies, is there's a lot of wasted spend. Mm. And WeWork is a, a massive lesson that everyone should take as to how not to waste spend because mm. it ruins your, your exit strategy, actually. And WeWork is highly publicized in a terrible position right now. And the other one is the one about Uber. Um, super pumped with Jared. <laughs> the, what's the guy into them from 30 Rock from the Sun? Um, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So that's the story of um, Uber. Okay. Um, and what that kind of, I tell them, like I so I give them the lessons. Like, so Silicon Valley is a parody of what actually happens in the tech industry, but it's legit. Like, mm. this stuff actually happens in the tech industry. Uh, we work is a lesson, we pumped is a lesson in how you need to rein in your spending. Just because someone comes and gives you a million dollars in funding, which some of my clients have had like millions of dollars in funding given to them. They want to go out and spend it all and, and like blow it. And I'm like, I'm going to give everyone bonuses and I'm going to have parties and stuff. Like, no, no, you, you've got to market. You've got to, you've got to redevelop. You've got to upgrade. You've got to, your first block is your company expansion. Mm. Your second block is what is left over. And the um, the Uber one is a lesson in how much of a mafia tech companies like Apple and Google are mm. and the lengths you have to go to not to bypass them but to overcome the roadblocks they put in your place. Mm. And so, yeah, I actually tell people, like, go and watch these TV shows. I know they're TV shows. One of them is a comedy. Um, the other two are, like, dramatised biographies but they will give you lessons that help you in the tech industry. My um, the managing director, investor of uh, DigiGround, our parent company, he also says everyone should watch the Spotify one, but that's in a different language, and I don't watch TV shows with subtitles. <laughs> 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 so I don't want to read TV. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I haven't watched that one, so I don't know if it's good. But okay. that, that one, he always tells the people to watch it because it's a big. The owner of Spotify, the the creator of Spotify, they have a heavy emphasis on user experience in their apps. Mm. They don't want any delay. They don't want everything to work perfectly and stuff like that. And it's not believable. Mm. It's not actually like a real possibility. You can't have perfect user experience. No. Um, this is one of the biggest lessons I've learned in the app industry. Everyone will say like, you know, Instagram has this thing called intuitive design. Mm. And I don't believe intuitive design exists. Okay. And I've given people who are absolute social media virgins Instagram and said, I've signed you up, make a post. And they've gone, I don't, I don't know how, not being able to work it out. Mm. And, you know, I, I worked out Instagram myself because I was invested in Instagram and learning learning how to use it whereas if you just give something like that to a random person they're not invested in it they don't care they're not going to even try to learn so mm. intuitive design to me is like a scam that people use in this industry to try and actually increase the, the cost of their services well isn't it more like a, and i think you know the tech space is a great example of this right where in the past before you went and launched anything you'd be like trying to tick all these boxes and, and have a you know, I suppose a, a perfect product, as, as close to perfect as you can possibly have. But nowadays it's more like um, with, the, with the speed of which you can roll out things, it's literally like, okay, you send out an imperfect product and then you rely on the user engagement or feedback to then optimise. Yeah, so that's it's very interesting that you understand that mm. when you aren't, um, like you, you don't have an app or anything like that mm. because you'd be surprised at how many people don't understand that yeah. and walk through our doors and want everything to be 100% perfect. I have to keep explaining to them, this is not how, you're not going to be successful. So many people think that you only get one chance in technology. Yeah. I'm like, you're kidding yourself, man. When Uber launched in Australia, um, it was like 2015, 2016, and I remember they did a 
special where you could, if you sign up to Uber, they deliver you a Ben and Jerry's ice cream thing. Mm. For the first like six months, it was, had a 100% crash rate. Mm. People don't remember, but you would open it and it would do the GPS locator and immediately crash. <laughs> and then you'd have to open it again. Yeah. And then you would be able to, and you'd, it'd be way out. Like the GPS that Uber was using at the time was way out by up to 100 meters. Wow. So you'd have to drag yourself around and put where you actually Again. are yep. and then just enter where you're going. And it took them like six months to fix that. Mm. It was an issue only in Australia, something to do with satellite coverage and all this kind of thing. But it took them like six months to fix that. Mm. And nobody cared. So I, I explain this to clients like, and people I, I, I do consultations with. like, Don't worry if it crashes. What you want to do is exactly what you just said. Get your app out there. Get your technology out there. See how the users interact with it and actually change it to suit how they interact with it. Yeah. Because no matter what you, you like, a lot of people will also think, like, the, the other thing I have, I've given talks in universities and stuff about how user experience and user interface design are just made up terms that don't exist either. Mm. And I know some UX designers and they're great guys and stuff. They get like upset that. with they, you yeah, they do. They get really <laughs> upset with that. So your whole job is a scam, man. <laughs> <laughs> the well, the data should dictate, you know, yeah. what you do. And so, because right. UX design, we have UX designers in our in in house, mm. right? And I do a lot of consultation on UX. Um, UX designers will tell you this is the best way to lead your client, your user to where you want it to go. Mm. But in reality, what will happen is you'll give it to a user, and as I said, that they don't know how to use it. Mm. If they're invested in it, they'll try and learn. But most um, learning of technology, especially in the app world, is done through users guessing what is supposed to happen. Mm. And then what will happen if you don't monitor is your app will start to be used in a completely different way than it's meant to be. Yep. And what you should do if you own an app or any piece of technology is pivot to that. Yep. That's sort of one of the conversations I've had that's in Silicon Valley. Yep. They talk about pivots. And I've been in a boardroom with like guys and be like, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to pivot. I'm like, oh my God, this is Silicon Valley. Yep. Um, so yeah, like w we have one app that it's, it's about to be relaunched in February that's a bill splitting app, right? A bill splitting app, okay. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, it actually started because um, in our office we were sharing, like giving Christmas gifts to everyone and it was hard for us to keep track of who owed who money, mm. actually. But, you know, I'd go out and buy like a thing and everyone owed me 20 bucks and I could never... I'm terrible with stuff like that too. Mm. That's why, you know, you have office managers. Um, <laughs> and so we were like, let's, we had downtime, so like, let's make bang together an app. And it was actually originally called Gift App, mm. okay? Um, and then one time I went out to dinner uh, at, um, in Darling Harbour with like 25 people. And everyone just, at the end of it, chucked money into the middle of the table. And then when we added up the money, we were like $75 short. Mm. And I was like, so it's somebody, we're $75 short, guys. Everyone's put money in. Everyone, like all 20, however many people were insistent they had put the correct amount. Yeah. So I ended up covering the 75 bucks. But I was like, man, what a bunch of... <laughs> yeah. And then, but that triggered me. I was like, wait a second. That gift app that we made could have been... Could have really, just covered yeah. it. Yeah. So... This, this app, like, we, we launched and we launched it out to people and go to it. And we found one of our employees' friends, what he was doing is instead of making a bill and saying, to, you know, I've spent $100 and you owe me 50 he would just make a bill that was $50 and he owes zero and you owe 50 And then allow, it would just enable basically you to transfer him 50 bucks. Yeah. And so we were like, wait a second. And then we went, after he told us this is how he thought you had to use it, we went and looked at all of the records of all the people that had transferred money and found like that was the majority way. What The way it's meant to work is we went out to dinner. You put in the total amount. Yeah, total amount. It's either even or uneven. Yeah. We're paying 50-50 or I spent 20, you spent 80, right? But instead people were just putting the amount that the other person owed. Yeah. And I found dozens of records like this. So we added this feature in and it became the most used feature actually. All, all it is is now like I can just send you 10 bucks. Yeah. Based on your phone number. Then Pay ID came out and ruined it for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was one of the things why it's like on the downer right now. We're, yep. we're fixing it. Um, then we found people were like, because the way it worked was you create a group and add an expense to it. What we found were people were like going on holiday and creating 20 different groups, mm. adding 20 different um, expenses to it. So we're like, wait a second, why don't we make it so you can add different expenses to those individual groups? Mm. Now, the reason like I talk about this is like all about that pivoting, right? We had a development roadmap that was 18 months long. Mm. It was on our wall, you know, like the developers would go and take a post-it note off and say, I'm developing this. It was in order of priority and everything. None of the ways that people were using our app were on our wall. Shit. Not a single one. Yeah. And th so then I was like, this is my very first experience building an app, to be honest. Mm. It was like seven years ago. I, I was said that there'd be... We were at WeWork at the time and I said to everyone, hey, stop, 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 stop. Something weird's going on with UChamp. Mm. 
we got to sit down and analyze everything and find out why people are using it. So I like spoke to some of the people who were using it. Um, like I said, we went through the data, the database. The developers, instead of developing, were giving us data exports, mm. and we were look like analyzing like this weird usage and going, "Let's do UChamp 2.0." Yep. How UChamp is right now, it's not suitable to how people use it. And our developer, lead developer at the time, was like, "Yeah, but people are using it wrong." I'm like, "No, no, we're <laughs> developing it wrong. Yeah. This is what I learned. We're yeah. developing it wrong." That's right. So, and then since for every single project I've ever done after that, I've done a basic launch, mm. like very something very small, and then monitored how people use it and then expanded it in a way. Like I have a massive, like every project has like a 300-page document where we're going with it. Wow. Um, but then what I've done is like I've developed none of it. You know, we sit there for like three or four months, get a few users and see what they're doing and then move on. And convincing clients or external people who aren't in the industry of this it's it's very it's much it's very hard actually. That's why I said it, like I'm surprised that you think like that because it's actually a rare way to think. Yeah, well, I think you know, and working. So shout out to Alta, um, who who I who I do some work with as well. Um, we're sort of you know in this weird sort of space where we're uh, a company that's about com- combat sports, but we're operating in the tech space, mm. right? And uh, the cool thing for me coming into uh, Alta was you know that I get to see things from a different perspective. Uh, and so bringing, I guess, that, that my background in automotive and all those sorts of things that I've done uh, into the martial arts space and sort of looking at, okay, well, what's what's Alta trying to achieve and what are they trying to do and how do we sort of mesh that to create the best user experience, so to speak? Um, I've had to learn a lot about the tech side and I've got, we've got this guy, um, we call him DY in the office and shout out to DY. Um, he's, he's, very, he's a very tech-focused guy, right? So, you know, I, I would come in and I'm a, ver- I'm a sales and marketing kind of guy, right? And he would come and challenge me in terms of my thought process on how I would come up with certain things, right? And so as a result of that, you know, I can sort of see how the tech guy thinks about things. And then I've got to like put that into my thoughts and my processes in terms of like, okay, how do we now package this um, to give the best experience? And, and likewise, you know, um, you know, when you think about what Alta does, we've got two, well, yeah, two, two sort of key clients. We've got the actual gyms, mm-hmm. you know, the bricks and mortar, you know, where people are getting their martial arts training. And then we've got the members and participants. Um, so people that are either part of our online community or they might already be training in a gym. And so it's like, how do you facilitate uh, the meshing of those two where it's not like we're just a business that just arbitrages the gym, right? So that means that we have to have a unique product offering. We need to offer different sets of value, right? And I think, um, you know, when you think about, you know, the, the automotive industry in terms of my background, right? Like typically it's like, okay, all the research and development has been done behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, the car is the car, right? Um, you, you get the product and now it's the responsibility of the dealership or the manufacturer to go and market that product. So you can't change the product, right? Whatever the car is, is whatever the car is. You can't like, you know, as a dealership, you can't go back to Mercedes-Benz or BMW or you, you name the brand and say, hey, you know, this particular C63, yeah, it's no good, right? And we say this because uh, our, user, uh, our drivers have said, oh, look, you know, we like this engine and we like the sound of this. Like they're going to go, mate, the product's the product, mate. Yeah. Like we don't give a f right go and sell it like you know they basically it's top down you know that's the car here's your target um your target dictates your allocation you want to you want to you want you want to make be able to make more money you need more product so if your target is say you know like whatever you let's use an arbitrary number and just say you know you want to sell 100 cars a month right if you set your target at 50 well you're only gonna get 50 cars Mm. so they don't give a shit if then you can't meet your business profit objectives because we've only given you 50 cars because you said, I can only sell 50, right? If you want more cars, we'll set your target at 100, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you have a business that's top down, the product is the product. And yes, I'm sure the designers take on board some of the feedback, but that's very uh, closed door, that oh, process. absolutely. Right? Yeah. Whereas, you know, you come into something that's a bit more open in, 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 some, in terms of like a, you know, when you start moving into like a technology sort of platform. Like, yeah, things change and develop very, very quickly. Yeah. And that's actually a nice thing to be able to uh, pivot and make some of these adjustments because you're getting this live feedback and provided you put a little bit of uh, thought into the bigger picture, you can actually make changes very, very quickly and roll out changes very, very quickly. Um, you know, sometimes I, I guess that can be frustrating for people, especially like, you know, uh, for tech guys and developers where it's like, okay, this is the roadmap. And it's like, oh, shit, now you're changing things on us. Um, but I think, you know, uh, being able to, to view 
that data and that feedback is is invaluable. And I, like, because I've been exposed to that now, it's like, okay, let's look at our conversion rates. Let's look at, you know, what are, what are our click-throughs and what's our cost per ac- acquisition and um, how do we adjust the offerings to better tailor to these sorts of things. So, you know, it's, it's sort of made me um, understand, you know, the processes around uh, the tech space a lot a lot more. And that's why, you know, I think like that. And, and I guess the other learning that I've got, um, and this was even, you know, in terms of my own uh or into like social media and things like that. Uh, in the, like in, in the couple of years that I sort of took a break from the automotive industry, one of the things that I, I did, uh, and shout out to my mate Charles who, who challenged me on this because um, he had built like this Instagram account that was um, quite successful. And uh, like we, had, we got into a bit of discussion and, and it was like um, he, he shared with me his methodology and then I was like, okay, is it really that easy? And then he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm going to set myself a challenge. And so then, you know, I've got like these secret Instagram accounts that I don't talk about and I don't really share, but like, you know, one of them's at 161,000 followers. Another one is uh, just shy of 100,000 or I think it's just shy of 90,000. Um, and another one's like just under 20. And like just three different niches that you would never really, ex- well, a couple of them you'd probably expect from me, but like one of them that you totally wouldn't expect from me. Um, and I, I just took it as a bit of a challenge, like, is it actually possible? And then after I proved to myself it's possible, I don't actually use those accounts anymore they're just sitting there dormant right like but it's like okay proof of concept right that um i understand how how i could how i could do that and what's the mindset behind that and that mindset actually applies to any tech company you know like you you need to be producing things and i guess you know um like gary vaynerchuk he talks about this all the time where it's like you don't need things to be perfect you need to have things in the market yeah and then be consistently refining your messaging and things like that definitely so you know, I, I really, and I always say this because, like, I really should take some of that mindset and apply it to, like, you know, pushing my own stuff uh, a little bit more. But I'm just busy enough that I don't really need to, right? Like, I'm fortunate because I think people get caught up in this idea that social media following is going to then equate to dollars in the bank. <laughs> it's internet bucks, man. It's and been around since South Park and yeah. the beginning of YouTube. It's internet bucks. Just because you have hundreds of thousands of followers doesn't mean you have hundreds of thousands of doesn't dollars. Doesn't mean they're monetized, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the thing. Like, the, the gap between... Um, uh, following and monetization is an interesting one because you know with these big accounts you know we try I, i've tried a, a few different methodologies to try and uh, bridge that gap and some have been like okay but they're not ultra successful it's not anything to that you know even with like one hundred sixty thousand followers on instagram it's not like i could make a living off that yeah right um it'd only be like a like a nice little you know a uh, little bit of extra spending money for the week but then the work that you have to do to monetize that versus what you get out of it it's I might as well just work a job. Yeah, hundred right? percent. Like yeah, yeah. this is what people don't 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 realize, and they go, oh, like that. that surely you got to be making money off that. And it's like, so you, you you actually have to respect the hustle when you see like guys that are you know building their social media following, and then you can see like they they try and do the Patreon the subscription thing. There's a reason why they're doing that. It's because yeah. social media isn't paying them what you think they're exactly. paying. Exactly. So I, I give a talk to um, university students about um, how I act ended up paying myself a dollar a day. Um, and I can say I do a comparison in the talk. Some I've, I've, last time I gave it was like one year ago, um, which is exactly what you're talking about. Because what I did, I used to be in a band, right? And we, we played like some one of our friends' parties and stuff. And we wore T-shirts with the band. It was called Deep Space Donkey, and it had like each of us wore a picture of a donkey and stuff. <laughs> um, what, what kind of what kind of genre? It was just um, covers of like pub rock classics, okay. you know. Um, and everyone wanted a T-shirt. And I was like, oh, awesome. I could sell these T-shirts, right? So yeah. I went and made a website and I, I put it up and I like w- developed it and I, I put up a shop and, you know, I organised all like the the orders and then I ordered them from, I think it was Vistaprint and I got them all printed and they came to my house and then I had to like pack them up into bags and I had to ship them and then I and, like ended up with like 40 bucks. Mm. And I was like, wait a second, I've sold 50 T-shirts and I've got 40 bucks. Yep. How does it? And then I went back and calculated all, them, calculated all my time and realised... It's, it's not as easy as you think. Mm. It's a massive investment in time. And unless you have that time, then you shouldn't invest that time. Yeah, You have to have... The, it's like a, the, making money off the internet is this massive investment in time that yep. people don't really realise. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like stuff like, you know, uh, uh, those prank videos and stuff like mm. that. But that's what those guys are doing. People who do those mm. are investing heaps of time in what they want to, want to be their job yep. to make money. Yeah, Some of them make millions of dollars. You know, some of them make hundreds of millions of dollars but you have to respect the fact that they've invested that amount of time yeah i could have very well been like a billionaire from my t-shirt business 
But the fact is I paid myself like a dollar a day mm. um, and then realised like I have a full-time job, I have rent, I have bills and stuff like that. I can't invest all that time in being making a T-shirt business. Yeah, you've got to be passionate about it, right? Yeah, like exactly. It, it's got to form like, you know, part of who you want to be, right? And so if it doesn't, then you're investing all this time and you, A, you're not going to be happy about it because you're like, oh, I could have been doing this or I could have been doing that. Because as with anything, when you start any um, sort of enterprise, there's this, it's the on-ramp, right? Like a slow sort of growth, slow, steady, slow, steady, slow, steady until at some point, you know, you might, you might take off a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, that it's that old saying of consistency over intensity. You want to find something that you could do for a long time yeah. and get that compounding interest as, as a result of it. Um, the, I was talking to uh, Jonty, who's our, um, uh, like our company, company secretary for Alta. Um, you know, he was saying to me uh, just yesterday when we, when we were catching up, and he was like, oh, you know, there's um, probably not a guys that have, have done as many, like, podcast episodes with other people like you, it, it, like, at least in Sydney, right? Like, because, you know, I'm, like, 100 and something yeah. episodes in, right? And it's, for me, it's like, uh, you know, I, set the, I just set a very basic target that I just want to do one a week, release one a week, and... Uh, over time, you know, the body of work will be there, right? Yep, yep. And, like, I, I love doing this, right? Like, my, my, I've always said the, the goal of this was never to monetize. If one day, you know, I, I decide to do that and there's money in it, well, fantastic. But, like, that was never the goal. And just because I love doing this, it, I think that shows in terms of, like, what I, what I put out there. Like, you know, I tried to push it for a little, bar, uh, a little while when I was um, – when, was, uh, was, when, I, when I had spare time. I don't mm-hmm. really have much spare time now. Uh, and was producing like the reels and, and the clips and some of those clips did really really well but then it was like you know is it taking away from what I actually enjoy doing which is the actual conversations themselves and if it is then I've got to stop doing that yeah right because I don't want to feel I don't want this to ever feel like it's a grind I want it to feel like you know I'm happy to do it I love doing this and and so that was the way that you know stick to the things that are important to me like the old 28 uh, 80 20 rule Pareto's principle Right, I focus on the twenty percent that I enjoy the most, and that will get me eighty percent of the result in the yeah, long term. Yeah, definitely. Right, and I think a lot of people like they go, oh, you know, it'd be fantastic to do this, right? And then they they start, and then they realize, oh, this is a lot bigger project than what yeah. they, what they anticipated, and it's all good. Like uh, along the way, you're going to learn a lot, right? Like the fact is, at least if you try, then um, you get those learnings, and if you've invested in yourself, like it will always add value to you in the future. Like I don't look at any of those things as like um as a, a waste of time like even the time that i spent doing those clips that that allowed me to work on my editing skills so i know that when i apply that to other projects um that aren't necessarily podcast related i can, i'm better at editing yeah, uh, yeah in the future so i i want to go back to uh this little story that we'll, we started on we didn't really get to talk about it but you know when you guys were playing commodore 64 and then you decide to start um coding your own games yeah so eight years old my brother got a commodore 64 um which you know was a family um Commodore 64, but it was actually his. Yep. Um, and one of the things you could do on Commodore 64 was, was basically it had opened in its um, uh, user interface uh, operating system. You could just start typing. Yep. Right? And you could actually type. It, it had a RAM, so you could save your um, your code in the RAM and then run your game and or whatever you made. Like So we started out with, like, you know, the Commodore 64 instruction manual had some small information about, like, how to do um, print, like, hello world kind of thing on the screen. Yep. Remember, this is like 1988. There's no internet, like mm. literally no internet. There's the library. It's also the very beginning of personal computer times. So what we would do is we would go to the library and borrow books of code that would be like make a game, right? And you just have to type what was in that book. Yep. No explanation as to what you were doing. Um, like just just t- basically t- copy. Copy, type. Yeah. yeah. So when I was eight years old, I could type like 60 words a minute copying this thing and we would take turns me my brother my mom uh sometimes my sister she wasn't so invested in it as us and you know then you'd run the game finish it you save it to a floppy disk you run the game and it wouldn't work <laughs> so then you'd have to you'd come up with an error come up with it and the errors were always back in those days very like just it just said like syntax error yeah so now you've got to go reread two thousand lines of code and match it up against your book to see where you've accidentally put a full stop instead of a colon yeah um so what we actually started to do was cross-matching between different games that we would copy, work out what the things were doing mm. and taught ourselves. So my brother was nine and a half, ten at the time and I was eight. Taught ourselves basic mm. programming language. So then we could start making our own games. Um, it, you know, it was really interesting. I made like some funny uh, adventure games. Um, like if you know the old um, 
King's Quest games and Leisure Suit Larry and stuff mm. like that that became graphic games but were originally like text-based adventure games. Um, we made a whole bunch of them. We made some games with graphics, stuff like that, because with basic you could draw on the screen by typing coordinates. Yep. So that was one of the worst things to do. Like your graphic didn't match the book. Yeah. And it was me meant you would mistype like one specific coordinate. Oh no. And you got this like pixel over there. Yeah. <laughs> like literally like thousands of lines and going through going like okay, I've got zero zero one, zero zero four, zero zero six, zero zero seven, like just over and so yeah, we taught ourselves how to code. And from the time we got an we got an Apple two E as well um from the time i was like eight to the time i was like 14 or so uh, we upgraded to a commodore amiga mm. um that's what we would do for mm. fun and you know in those days video games were, were actually relatively cheap when you compare the number but you know inflation and all that so you could buy a video game for like 20 or 30 bucks yep but the problem with it was we didn't have 20 or 30 bucks we'd make our own games <laughs> <laughs> And so that's what we do. We we just and we, yeah, we taught ourselves to do it by just copying code and trying to work out what individual things did. So when I hit uh, eighteen, I did a diploma of IT. Yep. Now I'm terrible in school. Like I, I can't. My problem is really I can't actually learn in a classroom environment. I actually find it difficult even one on one for people to teach me things mm. um, if they're just talking. People always say, like, picture is worth a thousand words. I actually prefer the thousand words. Yeah. I'm happy to read a massive block of text and I'll take away everything from it. Yeah. But give me, like, a video to watch or something like that and I'll, I'll walk away like, I don't know what just happened. Really? Yeah. So what do you think What do you think um, drives that sort of behaviour for you? Like, was that just from learning all this code? Yeah, I think so. Like, it stemmed like from that because that's yep. what we'd be looking at, right? So the books would be just, like, seriously, like, 300 pages mm. of, like, just code, just text. And then the last two pages will be screenshots of how the game is meant to look. <laughs> <laughs> and there might be like, um, you know, there was like multiple volumes you could buy and there was some, or we borrowed from the library, there was some things that had like five games and like massively thick tomes, you know, like they look like massive encyclopedias. And that was it, like, I think I picked up that habit. So when I went to learn 3GL programming, or I did my diploma, of my first diploma of IT in like 90, 97, 90, 90, sorry, yeah, 97, 98, one of the... Subject was 3GL program with 3GL programming, which is cube like basic, mm. which I already knew off by heart. Mm. I knew everything. Um, now the issue I had there was I couldn't function in a classroom environment. Mm. I had already h- had the same experience at school. Like I said, I just I just stopped going to school when I was in year eight. Yeah, I couldn't so handle it. So wait, so fill in the gap here. So you stopped going to school in year eight. Did you ever go back to? So uh, yeah, I, like like I said, I was like a little shit. I was so naughty. Right. Yeah. Um. So. You know, I went to, in primary school, I would get in a lot of trouble. And then we moved from Wollongong to Sydney halfway through my year six year. Okay. Um, my brother was going to Edmund Rice College, which is a Christian Brothers College in Wollongong. He was in year seven. And because we moved halfway through, it meant that I couldn't go to a Christian Brothers school because mm. I'd missed enrollment. So I just got dumped at Ashford Boys. Yep. So this is the first time in my schooling life I was at a school by myself without my brother. Mm. And because I'm like, kind of smart ass actually like uh, i was so like uh, i used to when i was like, young i used to say i got bullied by all the kids that were bigger but now i as i'm older i realize i actually used to bully everyone because i was really small really really small but i had a sharp wit i would like i was i was really enticing people to beat the crap out of me yeah so i was at this house for boys um really uh, really unhappy i hated going to school i couldn't learn anything my teachers always said like you know it's a typical teacher thing he's really bright if he if he committed himself yeah, and blah blah himself but I, I, I was getting really high on all the tests, but I just hated it. So I just stopped going. Mm. And what I would do is I would, Ashford boys, I don't know about now, but in that time, they had the homeroom before recess. Mm-hmm. So I would leave my house in the morning, catch the bus to Ashfield. Um, then I would hang around in Ashfield until 10 minutes before homeroom, go to homeroom and get my name marked off mm. and then leave and go and hang around and steal stuff. Well, you just walk out of the gate and nobody uh, would yeah. stop you? No. <laughs> so bad. It was terrible, right? <laughs> That's why my record that I held there for truancy was partial truancy because yeah. technically I was at school every day. Yeah, but I'd you got marked s- off, but yeah, then yeah, you missed all there. six periods or whatever it was, right? And then because I had nothing to do all day, and I started to just be a juvenile delinquent, my mum said, "My mum sent me to live with my dad. Mm. He was a much harder taskmaster. Like you know, he was. I was kind of scared of him. Um, so then I went to Dover Heights." But the thing with Dover Heights was, again, like, I had no one. Mm. It was another time, like, and when you're 
when you're eight and you have no one and you move to a new school, it's really, little kids make friends easy. Yep. I said, go to the park. My daughter has a friend within like five minutes. Yep. She's found Lorelai, the whatever seven year old from whatever suburb, knows her whole life story. When you're 15, you go, the friendships and groups are already established. Yeah. So again, I hated it. I hated it so much. So I lasted like nine months going to school every day and then again, just stopped going to school. Mm. Um, so year 10 was the official, year 11 was the official, like I'm done, like uh, yeah, I left out. school, yep. Yeah. So my dad said, like, if you're going to leave school, basically you've been kicked out of school because you don't go, you're not going to pass and so on. You have to have a job or you have to study. So I had a part-time job at Pizza Hut mm-hmm. and I became a full-time staff member at Pizza Hut. Yep. But man, like, when you're 16 years old um, and you're a full-time employee at Pizza Hut, day starts at 6.30 and ends at 3.30. So I could hook up with my friends from school and stuff afterwards, but I was so tired mm. that actually I couldn't and I had no social life, so I just quit my job. Yep. Um, I actually ma- I, Technically, I got fired. I made it too difficult for them to continue my employment. <laughs> How did you do coming, that? Coming late, calling yeah. in sick, uh, doing a really poor job and stuff like that. How do you do? Wait, were you making pizzas or? I was doing everything. Okay. I was I was like, if the, one of the things about it was like, um, I couldn't be a manager because it was dining. Yeah. And oh, I was man- back, okay, okay. Yeah, back yeah, in yeah. those days. Okay, so to put this into context, you know, Pizza Hut used to have uh, restaurants. Yes. Where people could go and uh, it's like a bit of a buffet, right? Like yeah, all you can eat. They put the pizzas out, everybody takes their slices. All and you make can eat. You pizza, pasta, salad and dessert. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the problem was I couldn't hold the beer manager because you have to can't be listed on the liquor license unless you're over 18. Yeah. And that was actually, like, I had butted heads with even head office about it when I was, like, 16 years old. Yeah. And so, yeah, I made it uh, impossible for me to continue working. And then my brother moved in to my dad's house as well. And so what we would do is we would go and play, like, Magic the Gathering, yep. uh, Dungeons and Dragons and stuff with our friends uh, to all hours. Yep. And then come home. And we were just basically leeching off my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, my brother had finished school, uh, like actually finished school, did his HSC and stuff like that, but didn't have any like aspirations to go to uni or anything. So we were just bumming around. So my dad got really frustrated um, and my, my brother and him had a fight and he kicked my brother out, so I left too. Okay. So uh, I went and slept on the floor of my mum's apartment. She had a two-bedroom apartment and I was sleeping on the floor there and I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. So then I really as quickly as I could got a job and I was an ac- as an accounts clerk in an engineering company. Okay. Because, like, my typing speed was so f- so high by this stage. Because like, mm. I continued with the time. So, like I said, when I was eight, it was, like, 60 words per minute, 99% accuracy. By the time I was 18, it was, like, 130 words per minute, 99% accuracy. My data entry keystroke rate was ridiculous. Mm. Um, I got, when they did the test for this accounting firm, because it was just basically data entry, I got double the next closest person yeah so like okay so yeah, they were like, yeah, be fast. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um but that was also super boring for me because the girl that i replaced i found her to be like aggravatingly slow mm. and she was taking a month to enter everyone's time sheets but i was doing it in like three days yeah so what i would do is i would do nothing for a month and then in the last three days of the month just smash out all the time sheets <laughs> And the, the um, I got to give it to the lady Donna. She was she was awesome. The um, assistant accountant. She knew what I was doing. Yeah. But she had no other work for me. So in the end, she started to tra- want to train me to be an accountant. But I wasn't interested in being an accountant. She asked, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "You know, I want to be in IT. I want to be a software developer." Mm. And at the time, they were coding this um, custom database for their engineering. So she introduced me to the in-house coder, and they said. I, it was in, I can't remember the language it was in, but I, did, I didn't know it. And so they sent me to do this diploma of IT. Yep. So did this diploma of IT. I'd moved out of home from my mum's house. I was living in like Chippendale in this terrible rat-infested house. <laughs> 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 Doing this diploma of IT. But it was so frustrating to be in class. Mm. Now at the time, TAFE had this thing called an assessment centre, mm. which they scrapped, um, where instead of going to class, you could go do the assessment. Yep. And then you did, you just passed. Pass. Like so soft paced. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that. Yeah. For all the subjects. Yeah, nice. It was thirty five bucks each. Yep. And so I didn't have to enroll in the rest of the subjects. And I completed my diploma in like uh after the first term. I'd done two years worth of assessments. Yep. And then like it was one year later they scrapped the assessments and it because of people like me. Really? Yeah. Because uh, like when I so I went I went to TAFE as well for my um mechanical apprenticeship. And so I think the first time like they usually sent um the, the the, the guys to go to uh, Blacktown TAFE for the mm. classroom style yeah, yeah. and I was like this ain't gonna work for me you know I was I was studying at uni at the same time and I was just like I need to 
I need the soft paced option. So then um, transferred to Hornsby and it was great. Like I, I used to just rock up, um, just spend my whole day just doing assessments because I'd, I'd do the pre-work in the books so that I could just skip through and do all the practicals. And like I had a great relationship with the teachers as a result of it because they're like, you know, Johnny doesn't muck around. He's not like, you know, other apprenticeship kids who might, you know, be like, might be their first experience you know, trying to learn themselves kind of a thing. I, I would just literally, I finished, like it's meant to be three years at TAFE, I finished in two, um, just doing assessments every Friday. And, and yeah. yeah, so they, because the problem with it was at the time, it ruined the, um, the cash flow. Ah, uh, they want to keep Because I for wasn't longer. paying for terms. Yeah. I just went and paid like, you know, I got paid monthly. Yep. Um, and I had like a hundred bucks. Yep. Like spare, so I'll just go do three assessments. So after like three months, I completed the whole course. Yeah, okay. So I spent like you know three hundred bucks on a thing that was supposed to be like two thousand dollars or yep, whatever. So yep. it kind of yeah they they it wasn't the best way to do things anyway because getting someone to just go do a test doesn't mean they're competent. Mm. Um, like years later, I got into education, learned a lot about education as well in this regards. But we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing this um, diploma of IT. And one of the assessments was to make a cash register, and I didn't read it very clearly. <laughs> Um, and I made a database yeah. instead. So what it did was, it was for Al's tool hire. You could enter into the arrays your all the, the, the products and the tools, mm. the costs, the, co- the amount of money it cost to buy and the amount of money you sold it for, and you could recall customer orders and all this. So I did all this in like um, basic um, on a PC. And I handed it in and I was like, no, you were meant to make a calculator. Mm. Just enter two digits. They gave you, you made something dollars. complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they said, normally we mark on a curve in this yeah. thing. So you've you've ruined the curve for everything. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So I resubmitted a new assignment. But yeah, I'm at this um, a engineering firm in the accounts department trying to get into software development and yeah. working with the software developer. And then my friend offered me this position at Harris Technology building their database mm. because I showed him my basic. What you built. Yeah. yeah. And then, so I quit my job. And I went to work at Harris Technology. It wasn't building a database. It was data entry. Yeah, okay. Okay, it was taking the stuff from their old database and manually typing it into their new database. Mm. Because this is 1999 and they didn't have good export-import scripts and stuff yep. like that. So I only lasted two weeks there. And I went, screw this, I'm out. And yep. left. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, I was on the dole for a little while. And I was just, all I would do all day is chat on the internet on IRC. Yep. Um, and... I met this girl from Coffs Harbour mm. through IRC and then she drove down to Sydney with her friend. Whoa. Um, stayed at my house and stuff like that. And then I got together with her friend. Okay. So that became my <laughs> girlfriend, right? Yeah. And we were only together for... So I got together actually on my birthday and then in May she was pregnant before oh my wow. birthday. Yeah. Um, and that's my son Jordan. Like he was, he was born then like 20, 21 years ago. Yep. I moved to Coffs Harbour with her... Because, you know, she was having a baby. Her family's from Coffs Harbour and stuff like that. When I got there, Coffs Harbour at the time was the f- had the fourth highest unemployment rate in Australia. Oh, shit. So I needed to get a job and, you know, Do support something. my family. I'm yeah. in Coffs Harbour. I applied for 800 jobs and didn't get a single one. Really? A lot of the time I was told I was too old. And at this time, I'm, at this time stage, I'm 21 years old. I was too old. Were you just applying for like entry level anything, jobs? Anything. Anything. I applied yeah. for anything. And so my, my girlfriend, Jordan's mum, told me, um, let's just go to TAFE. Yeah. So I went and did a diploma of IT because yeah. everything I had learned two years ago, three years ago was, was out, of, out of technology now. Everything's changed. And I really got into hardware in this diploma of IT, like really heavily into hardware. I was really like interested in it, like building the PCs, analyzing different frame rates and stuff like that of different combinations of graphics cards and motherboards and stuff um and then we moved back to sydney after i'd finished my diploma of it and we broke up mm. it was not obviously not a good relationship because we got together after like after two months after getting together she's pregnant yeah <laughs> so she moved back to coffs harbour and I, again i didn't know what to do i was like alone in sydney my my son had been taken away from me um and i got a job in a computer store building like what i applied for was to be their tech guy managing all the hardware. Mm. But what they gave me was a sales job. Mm. And I'm like terrible socially, man. <laughs> At this stage especially. Like t- I hate talking to people. I, I really hated it. But I had to do the sales. Yeah. And so 
I was the second best salesman in the place yep. because I just wanted to generate money to be able to send it to my kid. But I got really into the hardware and I taught this Turkish guy, I can't even remember his name, everything he knew about hardware. Found out recently he's in like some $200,000 a year job. Yeah. So he's done well. <laughs> yeah, it was good. He, I bumped into him on the train. He was like, oh my God, thank you so much. You like made my life so good. And wow. like, I was like, oh, okay, cool, man. Yeah. Who are you? And then <laughs> he reminded like, me, he's like from the computer outlet. Wow. I was like, cool, man. But yeah, that, that store, uh, what it was, was a refurbished computer store selling refurbished computers. And what I found at that stage was I could buy brand new computers if I built them myself for cheaper than these refurbished computers. Mm. And um, that's what I started to do. On the side, I would sell computers. custom-made computers. Yeah. Um, I actually like walked around and did pamphlet drops and stuff for this, man. It was called PC Foreplay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> people would call me out still be a thing like hello they're like is this PC4 play yeah man it's PC4 oh hello hello <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. what would you like uh, yeah what, what do you need uh, sold a few computers and stuff like that and then the computer outlet closed down mm. it just shut down like it was, didn't make a lot of sense so again I was like I don't know what I'm going to do I, I'm, I'm fully like I want to be in computers I actually technically had no experience because, yeah, like I said, I've gone from Pizza Hut to an engineering company in the accounts fund thing, mm. a data entry clerk at Harris Technology to a salesman. Um, a refurbished computer. Yeah. yeah. So how am I going to – and I was – at this stage, I was like 24 years old. Yeah. If I was too old in Coffs Harbour to, to get entry-level jobs, I'm too old in Sydney to enter into software development. And I hadn't actually updated my software development skills. Mm. I hadn't learned any of the newer up-to-date languages. So my mum, actually, she worked in um, International English Language College. Mm. Um, she asked me if I wanted to do some temporary work, which I was like, sure, I need some money, cool. And so I just did filing for a few weeks. But then um, they asked me, can you also do some data entry? <laughs> <laughs> my whole life, freaking data entry, but in different industries. Yeah. Um, and so I started working there in the student services and registrar's department, processing applications and invoices and stuff like that. And then the head of the student services department was a marketing manager. And so I was talking to her about marketing mm. and she told me this, she said this funny thing to me, like, because I was telling her how the students would behave based on what, um, the special, how students or agents would behave based on the specials that they would give. So yeah. they would say like, we're thinking of offering this special, but like, you know, agents are going to exploit this by doing blah, blah, X, Y, Z. And she said to me, you should be in marketing because you understand how people will react to things. Mm. And she started to get me to do more and more of the marketing. I lost that job. I got fired because I um, <laughs> called someone. Uh, it's so embarrassing for my mom. I feel so bad for her. Go, go, go. You got to say it now. But I, I referred to someone as a cunt. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I got fired. <laughs> yeah, poor mom. Sorry, mom. Um. And then I went and worked at InSearch UTS for a while, but that was demented. Like universities are way overfunded, way overstaffed. And I got in trouble there because I was processing queries too quickly and making everyone else look bad. Yeah. We ran out of um, brochures in the in the student service office. So I just went up to the marketing department and grabbed some brochures and brought them down. I was told that's not how you do things. You contact your supervisor. They will contact the marketing manager. They'll put in a requisition form. It'll take like five days. I'm like, dude, we need brochures. Like, yeah. fuck. Yeah. So after the, the six months, I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. How frustrating is yeah, that, right? Yeah, it's so annoying. Like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm a doer, you know? I, I get things done. Yeah. I don't want to have to go through these demented processes of contact this guy so he can contact this guy so he can contact this guy who can come back through all that process and then tell me, yep, it's okay to go pick up a box of brochures now. Yeah. I'm like, I could have just gone and picked up a box yeah, of it's brochures. it's a blo bro. bloated <laughs> workflow, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's universities though. And so then I went, I, I like left that after six months and went and worked as a registrar at a high school preparation college that had some adult students, like all internationals, mm. but mainly rich, young Chinese kids. Yep. Referred by places like Scotts and Kings and mm. stuff like that. So we had a, a campus in North Sydney uh, with like 150 like super rich Chinese kids. Yeah. Uh, it was crazy, like how much money they would just throw around. Uh, I'd be like, you know, what's your address? Oh, my dad just bought me this apartment in the city. You know, yep. this kind of thing. Oh, my God. Like <laughs> <laughs> you're 16 years old. What are you doing owning an apartment and living by yourself? Yeah. Um, and I was there. That was like actually also at the same time I'd gotten with my wife. So we were going, we were dating. And so I went through all of those jobs. 
in between I had like little odd jobs as well. Like once I was a trolley pusher for a few days and I did some door to door, you know, hawkers, I did door to door marketing, yep. things like that. I worked at Eagle Boys for a little while, like just all these little <laughs> things. Back to pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, also in that period, I had moved between 20 different houses, apartments, staying with different, living with my brother, living with like other girlfriends, stuff like that. Like really quickly, I'll just move houses. But when I went to Milton College in North Sydney, I was there for seven years. Wow. And I also lived in the same apartment for five years. And I realised, like, my wife, she's my wife now, this is why I had to put a ring on it, she made me actually become an adult. Mm. So prior to that, I was a child, mm. unable to determine what I wanted to do, mm. unable to make up my mind and unable to focus. And she, like, made me focus on something. Now, I didn't want to be a student services registrar for an international high school preparation college for rich Chinese kids. I didn't mm. want to do that. But she made me think about what I wanted to do. So while I was there, I inv invested myself in all of the marketing. Mm. I got really heavily involved in all of the marketing. So deeply into it. Um, I basically automated my work by making a database because I could still do that. Yep. Um, and so I could spend a lot more time on the marketing. And after seven years, this job opportunity came up up the road. It was literally like up the road, um, which was growing an international language college's domestic market. Mm. So they had basically like the only – in the international education industry, everyone is, is uh, non-Australian mm. except for a bunch of the teachers. Yep. So this college, which is a hugely successful college, had like 3,000 international students. They needed to hire a white dude. Who knew the industry? That's what their owner told me. Like, you need, I need a white dude who knows the industry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. No worries. So I became the marketing manager there. And again, like, it was hard for me to leave because I'd been there at, at Milton for seven, seven years. years. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like I said, I was, I was an adult now. I, I, I had invested time and effort and everything. But it's lucky I left because two weeks later they closed down. Oh, wow. Yeah. What happened? It ended up that the owner... All she cared about was making sure staff got paid. Mm. And the company wasn't profitable, even though to us it looked profitable yeah. based on the information that we had as the management team. But the owner owed a million dollars in back taxes wow. and a million dollars in unpaid super. Huh. And when I left, um, some of the teachers had reported the missing super. Yep. So the government came in and basically shut it down, re distributed all of the students to other colleges, sold the floor because she owned the floor, paid back the super and the back taxes, and she was left with like 600000 bucks. Wow. Yeah, and I was like, God damn, lucky I got out of that. Yeah, um, dodged a bullet. Yeah, it was, it was like I had to go back there a few times and deal with the government, mm -hmm. um, and this is where I learned that dealing with the government is – this is the beginning of my journey of dealing with the government and how annoying they are, how like ignorant they are of what actually happens in life. Like – they fully actually like actually yelled at me, the government representative, because we had a student who was a citizen who couldn't speak any English. It was a Chinese student who was an Australian citizen, mm. couldn't speak any English, and he was going through our course before he went to mainstream high school. And they're like, that's illegal. All citizens have to be in school. Yeah. And we're like, they're in school, and they tell us, like, you're not a school, you're a college. Mm. I'm like, this is demented. Like, just because we're called Milton College, yeah. they're all high school preparation students. Now, like, this this one student should be in International Student Centre at public schools, mm. which it's a terrible place, actually. Like every, there's very f at the time, there was very few Chinese students there. Um, it's mainly for refugees, not for rich, mm. you know, Chinese students. So th they didn't want to send their kid there. They, they, when I talked to the dad a bit later, he was like, we went there, man. That was so gross. Yep. I don't want to send them. It doesn't even have windows. That mm. was what he said. It's like a like jail more than yeah. anything else, yeah. So that's why he went to us because we treated the kids really well. Um, but yeah, like after that had finished, I moved to uh, Australian Institute of Professional Education, built up their domestic students. Now it was around the time of fee help mm. um, and the vet fee help saga, and we were one of the colleges that that were accused of exploiting students for to, to take money for the government. Yeah. yeah. So I was, but I was there for eight, two thousand and twelve to two thousand fifteen, just three years. Mm. And we got closed down by the government. Mm. Um, and yeah, that was dealing with the government throughout that process was like quite a nightmare, actually. We, when they first issued the closure notice, we took them to the administrative appeals tribunal. Yep. Hired all the best lawyers. And our lawyer told us that we were winning. Sorry, my phone. 
going to be a spam call. Um, <laughs> we were winning the case. But he also met with the opposing the government's lawyer and the government's lawyer said, we know you're winning, doesn't matter, because when you win, we're just going to issue another closure notice tomorrow. Yeah, wow. And so we were like, what, what should we do? And I, I remember like in the middle of the night, like 10 p.m. at night, I was sitting in the managing director's office with all the other investors, the part owners, and I just they, we just said like, we may as well close down. Mm. Just may as well close down. Even though we had the tens of thousands of students who graduated properly and everything like that, we did have some. They ended up being 12 students who accused us of, accused us of exploitation. Yeah, wow. So I left that and opened DigiGround. Mm. Um, got an investor. And then with DigiGround, um, we started as a marketing agency because that's what I wanted to do. Mm. So we went to WeWork. We were the first people to work in, to be in WeWork um, at Piermont. And we moved in. We were first, there, first people there on the day. It was mad because they had like free beer. Yeah. So we're moving in just drinking beers all day. <laughs> 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 Terrible, <laughs> seriously. And um, the thing was, we had software developers. We had, I think it was seven marketing staff, or eight marketing staff, one software developer, and then like me as the general manager. Mm. We work at the time, I don't know about now, was filled with like one man show marketing um, people. Mm. You know, like my my managing director always says, just a person in their pajamas with a laptop, you mm. can be a marketing manager. Yeah. You know, so marketing agencies in here, but none of them had developers. And every time they would go to the reception and say, hey, we're a marketing agency, is there any businesses in here that has a developer? The reception would refer them to us. Mm. And we started to get all this development work and what we found was our marketing staff didn't have any work, so they'd go and find new jobs. Mm. But we kept having to hire more developers. Yeah. So that's where we had to pivot and to become a development agency instead. So now what we do is we develop software and market software. Mm. We do have some legacy clients left over from when we were a marketing agency, like five-year, six-year-long clients. But really we only want people who are in technology that we can market because that's our expertise. Yeah. And so, yeah, when we have downtimes and we don't have any clients, what we tend to do is make our own apps. Mm. So we can – there's a couple of reasons for it, and it's why we differentiate. It's not like I'm a salesman. Yeah. Um, it's all right. So myself as the general manager, uh, our tech lead, Dan, and the uh, um, managing director, Amjad, we can, we can be our own clients mm. and understand the frustrations of our clients yep. and know, like, what you go through with development. And it's, it's really funny because – I'm constantly saying to them, like the rest of the managers, like, you know, they'll, 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 I want this done. I want it done now and I, I need this change right now. And then I'll, I'll, I'll say to them, like, what would you do if a client did that? And they'll, they'll like, charge a variation. I'm like, yes, yeah, so I'm going to charge you a variation, like an internal made-up variation. Yeah. <laughs> to say, so this is what we, how we will deal with it. So now we have three main apps in the market. One of them, which I promote most, is Smart B. Yep. Um, it's a news and sports news and information application mm. um it's the most complex thing i've ever developed in my life from way back when i was a kid because so what it does is we generate zero data okay we take all of our data from like a hundred different sources yep cross match them in our system and then display them to the you you the user mm. and so it's funny when we launch like cricket stats in the, in the recent cricket world cup hey afghanistan was first wow and I was like, there's something wrong here. And I looked and it's sorted alphabetically. <laughs> 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 I was like, India was first. Like, why is Afghanistan there? Yeah. And then they fixed it. The developers fixed it. But now it's just in a random order. And even the developers can't work out what order it's in. So they're working on that right today. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the thing I concentrate most on. It's about 60% of the time. We also have this platform, Auction, which um, it's an event management fundraising platform. Because, see, that's another interesting story, right? We had friend of our managing directors, her son unfortunately passed away from brain cancer when he was 16. Wow. Um, and brain cancer, like, we made their website for them and it was the most depressing website I've ever made. Um, like, brain cancer is, the, I think it was at the time, like, the second highest cause of death in young people in Australia. Wow. Um, but it only gets around 5% of government funding. Mm -hmm. So, like, 95% of the money funding into research for brain cancer comes from external sources. Mm. Um Whereas things like, you know, breast cancer, which I'm not disparaging breast cancer, but breast cancer has a much lower fatality rate and affects less children. It has like 60% of government funding. Mm. Obviously, we need to continue to fund breast cancer. But we, what, instead of like the 
attracting funding for breast cancer, what the government needs to do is increase funding to other cancer mm, to well. level out the percentages. Yeah, it should just be like even, but not by taking money away. Mm. It should be by adding more money in instead of buying six hundred billion dollar submarines or whatever it is. Mm. Give some money to brain cancer research, but we help them run an event um, in dedication to their son, where they use the um, one of the popular event management silent auction platforms. And on the screen, they wanted to buy a machine for Westmead Kids Hospital. On the screen at the event, it said like they raised thirty eight thousand dollars, and their target was thirty thousand dollars. It was so good, we were so happy, and we had helped them, we achieved it. And then when they got the fees back from the platform, it was like fifteen hundred bucks mm. because the platform had taken all this money in fees. Wow! Uh, they they provided all the items items on consignment, so you know it had sold for two thousand dollars, but for two thousand dollars would go to the platform. Mm. So we were like, screw this, man. Next year we'll run again. We'll make you an app because we've got some downtime, some fair developers. I mean, you've got good developers. You never want to let them go. Mm. So we give them this platform. They have to make this, and it's just for you. And then what we'll do is we will go and find all the items. Instead of having consignments, we'll get customers and people to donate items. So they ended up raising their $30,000, and they got $30,000. Wow. But while we were there, this lady came up to me. She said, I've been to 110 events in the last three years with silent auction applications and your one is the best one I've used. Mm. And we were like, maybe we should monetize this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> sell people. So how do, how, does, how, do you, how do you monetize that? So now what it, the way it works is um, you can create an event for free. I actually have an event running on there now, um, like personal one for raising money for uh, to stop child trafficking. Create an event for free, but if you want to add like an auction to it, you pay $55. Okay. And then if your event raises over $500, we charge a percentage of the fees, but we're actually considering removing that as well. Mm. Um, it's 2% of the fees, whereas most pl- platforms charge 9 mm. So we, well, our goal is to keep the fees down as much as possible. We yep. just want all the money to go to Whatever charity. cause it is. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I've, I've dealt with people who like one lady... I'm under confidentiality arrangement with her, but I met with one lady who worked for the one of the largest charitable organisations in the world. Yep. And she told me she left because 95% of the money that comes in, and it's in the billions of dollars, goes to the people who work there. Yeah. And we were like, man, that's a lot of staff. And she's like, no, it's not like staff wages. It's things like the CEO of the charity flies first class to Brisbane for conventions and stays in six star hotels on yeah. the charity dime. That's yeah. And so that's that's our main thing. Like we want all of the money to go to the charity. Mm. Um there's that one which that's actually my personal favorite thing. Like I know I invest most of my time in Smart B, but auction is my personal favorite platform. Yep. Um and the other one we have is which is just relaunching because it went through some issues is Puppy Lovers, which is a dating app for people who own and love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> a dating app? Okay, hang on. Is the is the idea behind that that it's the pet owners who are, who end up dating, or is it the dogs that end no, up the dating? Pet owners. Because <laughs> when you, I have a dog, I got a dog one week ago. My son fully convinced us all to get a dog. Mm. Right. What, what two weeks ago. It's a it's a mini cavoodle. Okay. Um, it's a rescue. So seven years old. It was um abandoned at a vet because unfortunately the people who owned it loved it. They lost their house due to cost of living. Mm. Had to move into a rented flat and couldn't have a dog, so they yep. had no choice. So we took it. Love it. I love little Coco. But, man, it's an investment in, like, time. Mm. You know, we, we got my dad – my dad lives around the corner. He comes over and walks Coco during the day and stuff like that. So, yeah, the puppy lovers thing is, like, dog owners are a different breed of people. Mm. They invest a lot of time in their dog. And so when you want to go away with them or go on dates and stuff with them, that the dog always comes into it. So the guy who thought up Puppy Lovers was like, man, these people need a dating app of their own. Yeah. <laughs> like he's sick of Tinder dates where they'll be like, oh, no, I can't go away for the weekend because my dog. Yeah. So, yeah, we made this app. It's got around 6,000 users. Um, it's, it's pretty funny. Like I, I have to go through and uh, monitor the users and see that there's no like pornography and stuff there. We've had a few reports of like naked photos and stuff being sent. And wow. Like, we had one guy that signed was signing up on like daily. He's a dog washing company, and he put himself as like a user, like a man seeking a woman, a woman seeking a man, a man seeking a man, a man, woman seeking. Like had lots of accounts. Everyone, yeah. Where it was just an advertisement for his dog washing company. Yeah, okay. So we had to like you know I have to go through and cancel those things out. Um, but yeah, like that's that's about my three main investments right now is is like in time aside from jujitsu, mm. uh, is the um, smart bee auction and puppy lovers 
Um, we do have some other apps coming out soon, which like, you know, the UChamp one, the spill splitting one, we're trying to relaunch in around February, mm. um, which I hope is successful this time. Yep. So out of curiosity, you know, with Smart B, because you're sort of aggregating uh, news flow, um, was there any issues in terms of like, you know, do you have to pay people for that or? Yeah, Getty Images, I don't care what, if they see this, they are uh, basically like in control of the universe for images. Yep. Um it's, it's they're painful to deal with. Mm. Um, we aggregate news from SEN, um, the sports entertainment network radio stations. One of the biggest, it's the largest technically radio network in Australia, most listened to, and their news is very heavily featured. And we we get a news feed from them, but they have an agreement with Getty Images for their images. Mm. So they said you can't use our images. Yep. We contacted Getty Images, and we said we want to use them. We're, we're willing to pay the same as SEN does, and it's like tens of thousands of dollars a year and they said no they said because you're a betting company and we were like we're not a betting company we want an aggregator yeah Yeah. we're an aggregator we provide news statistics historical data yes betting odds and some bookmakers advertise on our site Mm. but we're not a betting company and what they said is we have to approach every individual sporting organization in the world deal directly with them and get their permission to use images for that sporting organization wow and i'm like Man, we really like do all the data. Yeah. You know, like there's there's um like something like twelve thousand sport uh, soccer organizations in the world that we aggregate data from. Yep, I can't contact all of them, and it's just this back and forth for months. And so now we have to manually change the images for the news. Oh wow! Um, so when, then, where do you source your images from? So we were originally because uh, we were using Shutterstock, mm. which doesn't have, good, have good, as good images as Getty. Mm. You know, it just has, basically all the images are old, but they're they're allowed to be used for editorial use. Yeah, okay. And it's for our news, which yep. is editorial use. And we had a guy like basically sitting there every day changing a hundred images, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, screw this man! You're paying this, this guy way, just yeah. to do this <laughs> waste of resource." Man. It, it, look, it only took like it takes like half an hour. Yeah. Like I've set up the workflow to only take like half an hour, but I'm like, this is such a waste of resources, man. So now what we're going to do, we made a default image for all of them, all of the different categories. Yep. So this is like SEN News for Rugby League, SEN News for Cricket, yeah, and okay. we just default that one. So if you go to the website, you'll see like the blue and red um, news is from SEN. Mm. And then the other or places we get news from, we don't have the same issue. They don't use Getty Images. So, yep. um, and then th- the biggest issue with it is is cross-matching data mm. um, for sporting teams and stuff like that. So... Uh, I, I use like um, you follow rugby league, a little bit, yes, not not so as much nowadays. But so obviously mm. with rugby league, you have sport, which is rugby league, then you have the organisation, which is the NRL, but they also have the NRLW. Yeah. Okay. Then under those organisations, you have the team like St George Illawarra Dragons, Sydney Roosters. Yep. Um, Bulldogs, whatever. Bulldogs, yep. And then in in the women's, they have seven same. or eight teams that have the same name. Yep. Then you have things like some bookmakers or data sources will call them. St. George Illawarra Dragons. Some will call them St. George Dragons. Some will call them Dragons. Some mm. will call them St. Dot George Illawarra Dragons. Yep. Um, so underneath that you have the players. And some of the organisations will say like, so the player is say Ben Hunt, but they'll list it as Hunt Ben. Mm. Hunt, B. Comma ben, Hunt. B. Yeah. Dot Hunt. B without a dot Hunt. Yeah. Um, one of them has like half back Ben Hunt. Mm. So cross matching that data, when we initially started two years ago, I was looking at it and like manually doing it to work out the next step. So now we've built a system in which we do a variation system. So when something comes in that doesn't exist, like bee hunt, we'll sit there and go, what is this? Who is it? Mm. What is our record? So we go and find Ben Hunt of the St. George Illawarra Dragons Mm. and we put a variation onto our Ben Hunt record. So next time a bee hunt comes in for rugby league, it'll automatically be linked to Ben Hunt. Which is all well and good, but doesn't mean we can't be really aware of what's going on because there's things like so often names will be spelt wrong. Mm. Um, we had one issue where there was like, um, I think this guy's name was Dylan Brown and it had an E on the end, but they listed it without an E in yeah. a lot of the places. And I had to go to the bookmakers and say, hey, you know, you spelled this guy's name wrong, right? And what did they say? They were like, oh, sorry, we'll fix it. Oh, yeah. But, you know, like, because they have to get it right. It's like yep. a legal requirement for them to get it right. Yep. Um, and even like one bookmaker accidentally sometimes put all puts all horse races as Italy, <laughs> so it'll be like Flemington, Italy. So we'll get an error. It'll throw up an error, and I can't put a variation in for that. And no, because like it's an, it's an incorrect team. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we have to still stay on top of it. So that guy that was changing images, he's now doing that. Yeah, now he's doing <laughs> that. <laughs> could out of curiosity, you know, couldn't you um, 
use AI to do some of that sort of yeah, stuff? Yeah, we're working on that now. Yeah. Um, our main AI function, though, that we want to work, because it's, it's all about resources as well when you're in technology. Mm. How many people do you have and how many teams do you want to put in? Mm. So our main AI now that we're working on is actually a wind predictor. Mm. What it will do is it will look at, because like I said, we collect all the data. It'll look at all the data and give you the most, most accurate wind percentage chance. And then the function that you'll be able to pay for as a user, like 10 bucks a month, as well as a bunch of other stuff, is you'll be able to apply your own filters to that data. Mm. Um, the, the example I give is always, there was a guy, Michael Crocker, who played for Melbourne Storm uh, years ago, and he never lost a game. So it's not to say Melbourne didn't lose a game, but if, Mel- if Michael Crocker was playing for Melbourne Storm, they didn't lose. Mm. So if you have that knowledge... And you can apply like the or the AI can have they can apply a filter to it. You can then go and look at how the AI has given that and re- apply apply your own filters, and then mm. the AI will learn from what you have done as well. Yeah, wow. Um, and then you'll be able to enter your tips based on that. So I can say that Melbourne Storm's going to win, um, and then the the system will record your tip, know if you got it right, and the AI will learn uh, from that function who the best tipsters are, why they're the best tipsters. Um, and how it can improve its own tips. Yeah. Um, and then people will be able to sell their tips. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Do you, don't you think people will get a, a little bit, um, what's the right word here, you know, uh, scared of AI taking over that sort of part of the industry? Like, th- I know there's, there's, there's plenty of guys there that sell their tips or have websites that basically, you know, they're, they're, they're tipsters and they want to sell their, um, you, know, you know, what their, what their bets are yep. um, so that other people can follow along uh, in the hopes that they make money or whatever. But, you know, uh, wouldn't AI be able to replace a lot of that sort of stuff? So there's, there's also a feel mm. that it's... Um, have you ever watched that movie Trouble with the Curve? Clint Eastwood? No, I haven't. It's about a baseball that. scout. Clint Eastwood's aged baseball scout that um, uh, basically uh, Skeet Ulrich is the new general manager of the baseball team and he uses all technology to find the best draft pick or whatever and they scout and they want to sign him and then Clint Eastwood and his daughter go out and find this other guy that's better and they do it based on feel. Mm. And prove the general manager and their technology wrong. Yeah, right? you know, Clint Eastwood's one hundred years old. He hates technology. He'll always <laughs> correct movies about it. But there is always a feel. So we we looked at some AI functions, for example, for the Melbourne Cup, um, and what predictions it gave for the Melbourne Cup. Not our one because we haven't. We're, we're in development for it. Um, but we looked at other ones. What prediction it gave for the Melbourne Cup? And then we also deal with some of the best best tippers in Australia. Mm. Um, and we did a podcast for the Melbourne Cup with. Uh, uh, was Dean Evans from Backer Winner, which is the best tipping company in Australia, mm. um, and Luke, who, who owns Gold Trip, the, um, the horse that won last year, and they went through all of these things, like who they suspect, who they suggest, and why they suggest them, and stuff like that. And their tips were actually ended up being more accurate than most AIs I saw. Mm. So they told us the favorite was never going to win, even though the favorite was like really like heavy favourite, they said it's never going to win and the, the odds for it that are being given are wrong and they explain why in our podcast. And what ended up happening with their tips was, because this is what professional punters do, is they broke even. So they weren't exactly right, but they broke even. So I followed their tip for the day. Mm. I put like, it was a bet on a couple of winners, um, a place and an each way, mm. and then a box trifecta. Mm. Um so the way it worked was if the box trifecta came off, I would have made 10 grand. Mm. But otherwise I broke even. Yeah. So the box trifecta didn't come off, but I broke even. Yeah. And so AI in theory, because they do it all on some kind of feeling that you can't program. Mm. And so there'll always be that. You know, there'll always, always be something like that in there with tipsters. Mm. Look, I tipped 96% accuracy in my NRL tipping comp last year. Mm. With no, all I did was analyze the data myself. But then sometimes go, no, nah, I still think this team's going to win even though the data says they're not. Odds mm. say it's not. Like just I had, I had a feeling. Mm. Um, I ended up winning. I was tied with my friend. Um, but I had the better points differential. But it was 96% accurate for the year. Mm. Um, I've seen some AIs that do NRL tipping that are tip about the same. Mm. So real tipsters and especially in the industry, like the majority of people who bet are old people, mm. Um they're not. They're going to prefer the real tipsters mm. over the the AI ones. If AI becomes super accurate, though, like super accurate, it will definitely take all their jobs. Yeah, it's probably definitely. the it's probably the end of online betting. Then I actually know yeah. I, I I I take that back because 
all that would happen is the bookmakers then start using AI to then infer absolutely what the rates are, well, power like rates. I work with bookmakers. Um, some of them are lovely guys. Um, I've never met a bad person in the industry, to be honest. But when you look at the it's market, there's going to be a lot of shady characters. Oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Let's I've never met a bad person. I'm not saying they haven't done bad things. They're, they're just nice people. Um, yeah. But it's a lot, lot to do with bookmaking, which I sometimes agree with and sometimes don't, is the marketing and mm. why there's a big push at the moment in the industry to remove. Uh, marketing mm. so the, the thing i always push again uh, push tell people if you want to bet is don't do multis multis okay yeah multis are the thing that people bet on most and it is a marketing tool used by the bookmakers to convince you to lose money mm. because you can do multis where you bet 10 bucks and win 1500 bucks yeah and it sounds so good but this year the afl uh this is what i agree with right so sports bet before um, afl every afl match give you a suggested multi mm. 85% of them lost. Yeah. And so people were jumping on those multis because it'd be like, and it's only 10 bucks to get $4,000 on this multi. But mm. the bookmaker is telling you to put a bet on it. Yeah. It's against their business for you to win. Yeah. Why would you follow them? So they're, they're going to be in a little trouble for that. Yeah. And I like I said, I agree with that. Restrictions on um, marketing where they shouldn't be able to tell people bets. Mm. Um, and the bookmakers all need to make adjustments for this. Mm. Uh, I think this December this year, there's a bunch of changes coming to legislation for bookmakers as well. So, yeah, wow. um, like they won't be able to advertise on television during games. Yep. Uh, they won't be able to sponsor sports teams, mm. things like that. Bec but it's because of that, you know, because they, when I say they're not bad people, they have some bad practices. Of course. Yeah. Well, then they I think it's the flaw of any business as it gets larger is that you know they're seeking profit, right? They're seeking bottom yeah. line. And what's you know if there's ways that you can sort of drive a bottom line that don't get you in too much trouble, they're all going to look for it. Like yeah. I think that's just the nature, especially like, um, you know, when you think about incentive plans, right? Like uh, the people that work there, uh, especially when you get to like senior management, they're incentivized based on how profitable the country co company is. Anything publicly listed, you know, is a is a publicly listed company for a reason. Is that you know your shareholders want a result, so it definitely skews, you know, the focus in terms of what you're chasing. Yeah, and. Yeah, it's a it becomes a very um, you know you don't want to go and say like it's not to say that the the system's completely broken. Like I guess that would be like uh, what people would say is uh, the problem with capitalism is that you know at the end of the day it all becomes a bit of an issue. But I think you know uh, humans we we have this tendency that we're chasing growth. Everybody's Absolutely. chasing growth, right? And then all that happens is like you know that that culture then gets instilled in the company that you work for because. Um, and this is, you know, uh, like to go back onto your comments about government, right? Like this is a problem with government is because people that work in the government, well, they want to have the opportunity to grow and develop and have a career. And so, you know, I always talk about this concept where in any business, there's only really three layers to a business. Uh, there's the leader, you know, the leader or the owner, so to speak. There's manager and then there's the employee, right? And if you're a, a sole proprietor and you're starting a business on your own, you're all three. You're just wearing all three hats. Yeah. But as your business grows, the layers start to appear. The separation between those start to appear because, you know, if you're if you're doing everything by yourself, there's a limited um, capacity that your company can get to, right? And once you reach that limit, you go, okay, now for me to make more money, I need more employees who are then doing that job. And then once I have more employees, perhaps I don't want to manage them. Now I need a manager to then yep. create those layers. And so as a company gets bigger, uh, that's where the separation between the layers occur. And that's what allows middle management. That's what allows people progression. And everybody wants progression. You know, if I was to go and say to somebody, hey, you're starting your career, like, you know, just like you, you were starting, you know, you, you, the, all these different careers, right? And if somebody was to go and say to you, hey, John, you know what? You're going to be doing that for the rest of your life, right? And you go, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you're stuck there forever? Stuck no there thanks. forever. No thanks, right? Even if you, if you, like, just even taking the Pizza Hut example, right? You got into trouble because you're 16 years old, you want to be a manager, and they're saying to you, hey, you're too young to be a manager, Right, when you're like, fuck this, I'm out of here. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing in any fucking business. So, you know, it's not to say that it's wrong that people want to grow. It's not to say it's wrong that companies want to grow. It's about, you know, um, what is the sort of like uh, the ethics around yeah. that? You know, what is the what should there be limits on how much somebody can grow? Probably not. You know, I sort of think probably not. But then people would say, well, that's how we end up with like you know big investment companies like BlackRock and Vanguard. Yeah. You know, that own shares in all of these different companies basically own 95 percent of the world yeah um like you know i i know there's a movement for the end of capitalism and there actually always has been an end movement for the end of capitalism 
Um, capitalism, is a, capitalism in itself actually isn't a problem. Capitalism is just an ideology. Mm. And people will promote that like, um, socialism um, is, a, is the better ideology because everyone is equal. But capitalism, actually, the original ideology was to reduce the working hours of everyone mm. and to reduce the jobs. The mm. goal of the original thoughts of capitalism was to get everyone down to, like, you know, only having to work 15 hours because money will bring everything in. Mm. That, that, that was the goal. And the problem with it is it's not the, the capitalism itself, it's the people that, that do the capitalism. You mm. know, there's the, it's the same, but it's the same with the communism and the socialism and actually anything, libertarianism, any of those ideologies. Once you put people in it and people want to progress and win yep. capitalism, win communism, that's where the problems arise. Yeah. So if you had everybody adhere to the ideology of whatever the ideology you have in place is, the world would be perfect. Yeah. But unfortunately, as soon as you have one person that doesn't adhere to the ideology, the world is no longer perfect and it creates a competition between everybody. Mm. No matter how idealistic and good and, and amazing you are about how everything should be equal, when someone is a little bit more equal than you, human nature is to try and get equal again, yeah. right? So then it becomes a race. I want to be equal. He wants to be a little bit more equal. He wants to be a little bit ahead. So I've got to catch up and then he's going to, now he's going to go ahead again. And so that's where capitalism falls down mm. because... Yeah, like I don't think there should be a limit. I hate the that billion dollar thing. Where mm. Once you get to a billion dollars, you can no longer make any more money, and you get as a meme on the internet, you get a plaque that says you won capitalism. Yeah. But what what the problem with capitalism is that um, exactly what you're talking about the ethics. Mm. People will do anything to win the the race, mm. you know. And the way you the way you score capitalism is money. Yeah. How much money you have. So yep. people will do anything to get a high score, and it, they it's just that's just human nature. Mm. There's Blowing up the system, like I, I'm not a mad right wing nut job. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Blowing up the system like left wing nut jobs want people to do is not the solution, and I don't have a solution because I don't think anyone does. No. If I, I, to be honest, I think the solution is everyone should care more about their own little world. Yeah. Um, and and forget about what else is happening. The only thing I, I really would like to see change in in the world actually is for government to concentrate solely on the improvement of human life, mm. functions that improve human life. So they should be concentrating on food, um, transport, hospitals, yeah. education. Services and infrastructure. Exactly. That's all, Yeah. right? But government is broken and, you know, love him or hate him, this is one of the good things about Donald Trump. Government is broken because capitalist and, and company investment in government breaks it. Mm. So one of the things that they say about Donald Trump is he wouldn't meet with lobbyists. Mm. Like he was really anti-lobbyists and wouldn't meet with them. Yep. And so that caused a lot of problems in how America is run. Because mm. then lobbyists couldn't get through to the president, which they normally can, give him all this money um, and make changes. Yeah. And so what would happen is they would instead meet with his subordinates. Mm. And that's one of the conspiracy or the theories as to why he would fire so many people. It's because they're getting compromised. Yeah, they're getting compromised, going to him going, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And he'd say, like, why? And he'd go, oh, this, the oil lobby told me we've got to, oh, get the hell out, man. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's what I, I wish, the, the one change in the world that I wish we would have. Government would remove corporation interest in government. Mm. And then government could solely concentrate on services, yeah, services improving the quality of life. Exactly, like that, yeah. all they should do is improve the quality of life. We don't need six hundred billion dollar submarines mm. to protect. If you've seen the um, uh, Utopia skit, like to protect our trade routes with China from China. <laughs> 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 That's the in, you know when the government invested in those submarines recently, that was it dredged up the, the TV show Utopia. They actually went through this whole thing like in two thousand and. 14 or something. It's a TV, Australian TV show that makes fun of government. Mm. And that's what he goes through. Like, the guys going with the um, military, like, why do you need $300 billion for submarines? They're like, oh, to protect our trade routes. From who? From China. Who are our trade routes with? China. Yeah. So, and that's what we've done. Instead of investing money in, like I was saying before, like cancer research, education. Education is super important, you know. Like, uh, the way they educate people now, you end up with people like me who can't be educated. Mm. What they need to do is be able to tailor education to individual needs. Mm. And, you know, my oldest son, Jordan, he's probably going to hate me for talking about it, but too bad. Um, when, he was, when he was in primary school, we, we sent him to, like, the best school in Coffs Harbour, mm. the best school in regional New South Wales. We paid, like, thousands of dollars in school fees, and he didn't work there. He didn't like, like it. No, yeah. well, he got, like, got in lots of trouble, like me. Got in lots of trouble, violent, got kicked out, actually. Oh, wow. And then he went to a smaller school, um, which only had like, you know, I, I can't even remember, like 20 students or something like that, like some ridiculously small amount of students. And they were able to tailor his learning to his need and he thrived. Mm. You know, two, even in preschool, it was terrible. Like he got kicked out of like two preschools. 
went to Bishop Druitt, got kicked out after like one or two years, goes to whatever the school was, it was some you know, like little tiny school, and had basically no issues for the rest of school. Mm. But then when he went to high school and he went back into that mainstream, like it was a public high school, after only like one or two years, all those old like kid issues started to resurface, stopped going to school, it's pulled to me basically. Yeah. You know? But if the government invested more money in education, they would be able to tailor education to those specific needs. And you wouldn't actually have things like that. Mm. And instead they're spending, because of corporate interests, industrial, um, what is it, military industrial complex, the even social media um, companies and tech companies control the government too much. Mm. Um, bookmakers, uh, I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble from the smart being managing directors talking <laughs> about bookmakers <laughs> so much, but bookmakers control the government too much. Sporting organisations control the government too much. Mm. Um, the government needs to spend, like, it, it's never going to happen. But I always talk to, like, my friends who are, I got a couple of friends who are in politics, so then what, like, what you should do is encourage your senator or whatever to introduce a bill that no lo- you, you, there's not allowed to be any lobbying anymore mm. and businesses and uh, g- uh, corporations are no longer allowed to donate money to government. <laughs> and just to see what would happen, because everyone who votes against it, then every single voter would know that that person gets money from lobbyists yeah. and has business investing in them, controlling in them. Well, it's pretty hard for... Uh, what's the right way to put this... You know, I think a lot of people that um, uh, are in the sort of capacities, you know, they're like people are naturally going to try and butter their own bread. Of course. And that's, you know, it's it's pretty hard to find anybody that's going to be altruistic. Like we're all human. We're all fallible in that perspective that we all want better for our families as well. So I don't think you can begrudge that. But it's like, you know, when you're supposed to be responsible for a greater amount of the population than just your own immediate family, right? Um that becomes difficult yeah. because that becomes – you're in a position of power and, as we know, power corrupts. Absolutely, right? yeah. So I want to I switch gears a little bit because there's yep. two other things that I want to talk about. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your jiu-jitsu journey and okay. then I want to come back and talk about family. Okay, okay. sure. Yeah, so – So, um, uh, like, I've been watching UFC uh, on and off since the beginning. Yep. Um, in 2002, I was standing in the middle of a um, – and I've been into martial arts for a long time as well, so since I was a kid – so did your parents send you to martial arts? No, they didn't. Okay. I was, um, yeah, so I did ninjutsu because yep. uh, I wanted to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle when I was uh, 18. Yep. For three years, two years. What a marketing. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Every ninja right. school should get onto that. <laughs> yeah. you know, if you want your kid to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, that's the thing. So I it's, it's made a resurgence. Like my son's into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, because yeah, they released those awesome movies. Like the latest yeah. movie was really good. I haven't, we haven't seen it, but like uh, he's, yeah. he's right into it. Yeah, it's one of those things that will last forever, but... I wanted to do Ninja 2 when I was a kid because of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And as soon as I was, I was an adult and I had money, I was able to do it, right? This is a joke. It's a terrible martial art. It's so <laughs> fake. <laughs> you know, talk about Bushido and, and Aikido, man. Ninja 2 is the worst one. But I, I remember standing in... The, I used to buy martial arts magazines and stuff like that. And I remember standing in the middle of his party having a massive argument, like full screaming at each other with my mate about whether the Gracies were, were good or not. Because it was post... You know, well, USC was 97. This was around Earlier, 2000. I think. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, like 90, 94, something like yeah. that. So this was like 2003, something like that. Yeah. So post like that Gracie era. Mm. And I kept saying like, I, I was arguing that Gracies had changed the world actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, because they had brought martial art, like a real martial art to the mainstream. Mm. That Like martial arts in themselves, everyone will always say, you know, like they have the memes, like I, I see red and yeah, and the body's at the, the floor. floor. Yeah, <laughs> but the Gracies had shown that there is a martial art that actually works. Yeah, and so I, I followed it on and off for years. But I was always a massive rugby league fan more than MMA. And then my brother got into the UFC, like really hardcore. Mm. Um, Big fan. Yeah, like he was huge into it. Like rattled off stats. He comes to my house and he put on UFC Fight Pass and and like tell me who the good fighters are and stuff like that. And I wasn't fully up to date. I just knew who guys like John Jones were and stuff. Yeah, and then he went and started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and then him and another one of my mates were at my house at Christmas in 2017 and they were talking about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and it ended up my mate, who I've known for like 20 years, also did Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu <laughs> and I had no idea what they were talking about. Yep. And my brother said, come for a trial tomorrow. Yep. Okay, so he got, like, really pushed me heavily, pushed me. I was like, okay, so 29th of December this was, I went for a trial. And it was really funny because he was like in the advanced class and he sent me to fundamentals. Mm. Because I was fresh and he was like three stripe white belt. Um, and so we rocked up to my BJJ at Camperdown and my brother <laughs> turns to me and goes, oh, no, man, sorry. 
Uh, it's, it's Ricardo is the teacher. He's like really like mean and angry. You know, um, Rickus BJJ. He was my first ever teacher, right? Yeah. I was like, he's so angry and he's so mean. I, I, I'm sorry. Anyway, bye. And left me with this like thing that there's like an angry mean teacher <laughs> be my teacher. But Ricardo was so nice, such a good guy. He's like one of a like, good friend of mine. Um, and he really got me hooked on it, like mm. really hardcore. But I wanted to do MMA, not Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Really. So for the first two months. I went to the my BJJ MMA classes they were running, and I did like for the first three months I did ten Brazilian Jiu Jitsu classes over three months, yeah, and every MMA class, yeah. Um, and then there was this uh, I can't remember the guy's name. His Korean teacher came one day uh, to teach the MMA and made a spa. It was the first time I'd ever been sparring. <laughs> he, I was like, man, that's almost massively fat as well, like 114 kilos, wow, was all fat. And he was like 72 kilos. Yeah, he held me up against the wall beat the living shit out of me, punched me multiple times in the face. At one time, I pushed him off, and that was it. And then he came straight back in, like, basically cage fought me. That day, I was like, I don't want to do MMA anymore. This yep. is shit. Yeah. <laughs> and he was so funny. He said to me, oh, you're so good. You're like a heavyweight. You last one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. But then I didn't want, I felt bad to leave, mm. you know? Like, I was like, I don't really want to do this Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I want to do the MMA, but, you know, with my brother and something we can hang out with. So I just started going to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instead. And then it was, you know, I went to, like, Mario's class. So, you know, um, I really loved his, like, technical explanations and, like, the tiny little things and how much there is to these tiny little things. And then after, like, the third month, I was holding some guy in half guard. And he said to me, man, your half guard is so good I can't pass. I'm like, I don't know what half guard is, bro. <laughs> you're just holding someone yeah. there. <laughs> you were just like, <laughs> you, you you locked your legs over one of his legs for, yeah. and you're hanging on for dear life. <laughs> that was it. Was like, so I'm like, what's good? What's a guard? Like this kind of thing. So then uh, actually after that class, I went and spoke to Ricardo. Um, he's a legacy now. Yeah. Um, about like what is half guard and stuff like that. And he explained it to me. And then I, I did a private class with him. Mm. And to me, it was like at the time, like this is like software development. There's so much involved in it that you have to work out where i can read a book and work it out myself mm. you know and that was it that's what i prefer as i said before like give me a thousand words like mm. so that's what i found with brazilian jiu-jitsu like i've why i fell in love with it like it's like i can read a book and work it out myself when i'm reading a book i can drill and roll mm. and so then i decided to enter a competition four months in yeah and i was like you know i had such good half guard no one could pass my half guard first competition was the autumn cup mm-hmm uh, I rocked up at 9 a.m. because I had no idea. Yep. I didn't bother like really you talking to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> in the I don't my um, first fight was at 3 p.m. Yep. So I'm there like by myself. <laughs> oh, no. Um, then I went to compete and my gi was wrong. I got DQ'd from my division because oh, really? the gi was what, wrong. Too tight or? It was, um, it was a ripstop gi. Okay. But it was, I just grabbed my top gi. I had three gis at the time. I just grabbed my top gi. I didn't know. I was like, man, that's a bit annoying. But then I ran to my BJJ bought a comp gi i said to the guy i think it was diogo professor diogo was there um i need a competition gi and he's like who are you <laughs> i'm like oh i train here man i need a competition gi i've got a competition right now and i've got to go do competition it's like all right cool i bought a gi and went up there and i was like i was still like a hundred and something kilos then and i fought this 72 77 77 kilo guy who demolished me beat me like 29 nil wow just fully like he passing threw, he's passed me, threw, took my back, back, mount, took me down. But he, but he didn't finish you. Yeah, that's uh? what I said. He had an Americana <laughs> on. Like he had this, the video is so funny. Like he has this Americana <laughs> on that's so tight. And then I just sat up because he's so much lighter than me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and th- but I was really hooked. And then when I went back and uh, trained the next day, I just jumped straight into it. And I, I like fully just went crazy. And this guy said, man, you got competition intensity now. And I was mm. like, I don't know what competition intensity is now. But I've seen the messages that I sent after the comp. Mm. Where I was like, man, that was so intense. No one could explain to me the intensity of this. But I really, really dedicated myself then to going to jiu-jitsu. Mm. So that's what I did. Just go to jiu-jitsu. I started to train five nights a week. Yep. And I was just going. And I kept competing. But I never won a match. Mm. I, I like... Um, what I started to think to myself is, uh, I'm so crap at jiu-jitsu. And then again, I went and spoke to like Mario, the uh, owner of my BJJ, and I said, like, I, you know, I'm so crap at it. I, I keep I, losing. I, yeah, yep. I just keep losing every every match. Like submissions, points, everything. Like every single way. I've been disqualified once, you know. <laughs> and he said to me, what's your game plan? I was like, oh, you know, I, I go to 
go to ha- get to half guard. Like so, what I do is I grab them here and I grab them here and I, I I pull half guard and then I go for a way to sweep and then I get to top and I pass their half guard with a tripod and then I go and I I do an Americana. It's like that's not a game plan. That's a sequence of events. Mm. Like a game plan is is you know. He, so he redid my ga- game plan. It was like get to half guard whichever way you can. That's if you're good at half guard, get to half guard whichever way you can. Once you get to top, stay in side control because you're good at side control. Then attack the arms. Mm. You're not good at chokes. So attack the arms. So he broadened it. And I realized, like, man, that sounds more like a game plan. Mm. Um, but then I still kept losing. Mm. And then I was like, screw this, man. I went and watched Sydney Open. I was forced to write white belt and I didn't compete. Mm-hmm. But the guy who won, I could beat. I've beat him before. Mm. And I was like, man, I should have competed. And so I entered... It was grappling industries, the next grappling industries. I didn't tell anyone. And then I got promoted to Blue Belt a week before. Yeah. It was heaps shit. <laughs> so you had to go into the Blue Belt. I went into the Blue Belt division. But I thought to myself, all right, I know I'm not going to do good because Blue Belt's beat me up. But my half guard is really, really good. Yep. Okay. It, it's from that time. It was really, really good. I'd done, I was doing two private lessons with Ricardo a week, uh, basically concentrating on half guarding gi and then heel hooks in no gi. Okay. Um, so. All I thought to myself was, I don't want to get past. Mm. That's it. I don't want a single person to pass me. So my gi division, the division was me and two of my teammates. And I was like, do you guys want to fight? I know you guys can beat me. Both of them submitted me, but neither of them passed. (laughs) 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 It's the most important thing. Then I went to the no gi division where there was more people and there was like five of us, all right? And, you know, grappling industries around Robin. Again, I didn't get past. One guy wrist locked me, but all the rest were... um, but two or two, there was two division, two decisions and two points wins. Mm. Nobody got passed. Got taken down, um, and I got uh, it was a mount. A guy mounted me. Didn't get the pass points though. That was the most important thing. I went to turtle to avoid the pass points. Yep. So he turned me over and went to mount. Now in this fight, this thing I fought this guy Emmett Winter. Uh, I haven't seen him around ever again, but I fought him there. Yeah, and he was the guy that mounted me. Yeah, and I was like, man, that's so annoying. That's so embarrassing, but. I also got penalized heat for stalling. Yeah. So then I went to Mario, Ricardo, and Salvador, and Diogo, the guys at my BJJ, and Sergio, who's also at SJJ now. And I said, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, yeah. I really don't know what I'm doing. And what they told me is, like, John, you just do jujitsu. Okay. That's what, well, that's what you do. You want to compete. So you need to learn how to do jujitsu, but also train to compete. Mm. If you, my, my main goal was to win. I wanted to do something, man. So I actually sat down with Ricardo and worked out, like, what do I need to do to learn how to do jiu-jitsu to win competitions? And it was like, we'll go through game plan. We'll go through different techniques, what to do, when and where. Uh, do some weight. I did some weight training with him. Um, every single time you go to class, you will have goals of what to do, right? So there was periods of time where he put, he put me on skills acquisition. Mm. So I would go to class and he'd tell me, like, go fight all the low-level white belts and just, just refine your half guard, refine those sweeps that you've got from half guard. Then other times leading up to my next comp, he said, only fight people who are your level and bigger than you. Mm. Because if you fight someone who's bigger than you and you can sweep them, then you can sweep someone your size. Yeah. So I was like, all right. And I took time off and I went to um, Grappling Industries again and I entered all of the divisions. Absolute. Um, absolute gi, absolute no gi, gi and no gi weight. Um, now absolute no gi at the time, and it still is, is open weight, open belt mm-hmm. for grappling <laughs> industries basically i didn't know mm. so i rocked up um and professor pete was the only person from my bjj there at the time because it's like nine o'clock in the morning it's absolute was on this time <laughs> yeah. i wasn't going to sit around and I, I said to him and then he introduced me to some guy that was there and he was like oh he's in your division i'm like that guy's got a brown belt and he's like yeah it's absolute no gi you, you fight this guy brown belt i'm like yeah, and that's when I realized like no uh, no belts. Yeah, no belts. Yeah, like, shit. Okay, cool. I'd been a blue belt for around a year. I was like, screw it. And then Pete like told me, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna lose this. Doesn't matter. I've got three other divisions. So he said, No, you're not gonna lose it. You've trained. You've practiced. You know what to do. Don't worry about the fact that he's a brown belt. Just work on what you got to do. I was like, Okay. My first fight was this massive, massive white belt. Right at this time, I was 94 kilos. Okay, way to come like down. 130 kilo white belt dude. <laughs> This is massive. And I pulled to my half guard, but I couldn't sweep him. Yeah. Because he just, he weighed too much. Mm. And I couldn't get technique into play because he weighed too much. But what I was doing was I, I was attacking all the time. And I, nothing happens. Z- nimble at the end. 
We won by advantage. Yeah, well, referees. No, yeah, yeah, well, referee decision. Professor Pete on the on the sidelines. This is where I learned to coach, right? From this thing, he said, "Don't worry, John. You won. You attacked. The other guy just laid there doing nothing. You definitely won this. You did everything. You were the only one who had like it just going like this. Referee gave me the decision. Yeah. Then I went up for third place medal. And I fought Emmett Winter again. And I was like, this guy's beat me before. I'm going to beat him. I was up and I was dominating. Ricardo had arrived by then, was coaching me through what to do. Got to eight nil up. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to win my first ever medal. Yep. And then he won 10 8. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. With a minute to go. Yep. He reversed me everything. I was like so dejected. But then Ricardo told me, like, just shut the fuck up. Don't worry about it. You came fourth. You won fights. You know, you're, on the you're yeah. getting better. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're not still losing everything. Yeah. So then I medaled those two times in the next two divisions as well. I got like second and third, I think. And I was so happy. And I was like, man, this is what I want to do. I want to compete. I'm going to be an old man comp- competitor. But then after my next competition, which was after like around COVID, I was actually like, I don't really like competing. Oh, really? Yeah, like it was just the, the, the builder. Because I, I want to, the problem with it was, was like there's a cost to it. I can't guarantee that people are going to turn up. Mm. Um, I can't guarantee that I'm even going to get fights because of my age and weight and rank. Yep. Um, I really want to do it, but I don't really like it because it can be that. Mm. I, I pay like 600 bucks for one fight or some crap like that. Yeah. So I, what I decided then after my third blue belt competition was I'm going to get more invested in coaching. I want to be a coach instead. Now, I don't want to like be a class teacher. I want to be a sports coach in jiu-jitsu mm. um, and I didn't really know how or what to do right so I was just a blue belt and I talked to one of my other friends um, and he told me like there are sports coaching courses so do one of them mm. so I did one okay. and I found out there's a lot more to coaching than in the in my course I learned the difference between an instructor and a coach mm. and because I did a specialty in combat sports right? yep. mainly they were talking about judo but he talked about, like, in judo, you will go to a class and you will learn judo from an instructor. Mm-hmm. In sport, when you're a professional, you'll meet with your coach who will ask you, like, what you did today, how you're feeling, what's your next goal, what's your next plan, so on and so forth, and be invested in you as a person, not as a person in your class, but mm. a person. So I got really into this and started coaching people, and that's where I'm at, like, now. I still compete when I can, but... I much prefer to, to build people up to competition, go through them with training plans. What do you know? Like, I'm not a personal trainer, okay? I, I, I'm one of the other things I learned from my course was coaches, proper sports coaches, although they'll have some knowledge of things, they will find people who are experts in it to improve the, yep. their athletes, right? Absolutely. So I'm not a personal trainer. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a, um, you know, even a jiu-jitsu technique. I do, I do some privates and stuff now with some guys. I'm a like my what I like to label myself is I'm a jujitsu competition coach, mm-hmm. um, and now I've I've met and talked to some professional first grade coaches of teams like from NRL and AFL and stuff like that and gone through this kind of stuff with them because of my contacts in my business life. Um, but that's like my jujitsu journey, you know. Like I've I've gone through this thing where I realized jujitsu is not really a professional sport. No, um, it's it's so overly amateur, mm. and the problem with it, the reason it stays amateur even from the, the top tiers, is there are guys like, you know, you'll have Atos. Mm. I'm not disparaging Atos. I think they're a really great gym worldwide and stuff. And they've got lots of world champions. But you'll have like Atos that has a guy who runs a gym and also has athletes, right? Yeah. But his main thing is he's running a gym. Whereas if you go to something like MMA, you know, like where you have city kickboxing, which I think is the premier MMA gym in the world, mm. they are there and dedicated to making their fighters world champions and also they have a gym. Mm. You know, it's the other way around. Yeah, it is. And I, I honestly believe the only professional athlete in the jiu-jitsu world, 100% professional athlete, is Gordon Ryan. Mm. And I think it because he has people in his corner, like even his girlfriend is his weight trainer, right? Mm. And apparently she's not a professional weight trainer, but she's a bodybuilder and expert on steroids. <laughs> um, her sole goal is to help Gordon Ryan be the best at jiu-jitsu. Mm. It's not, I have a gym and I'm a weightlifter and also I do personal training. So a lot of these guys who are professional jiu-jitsu people, they have like, they have personal trainers. Yep. But those personal trainers are not there to build them up to be world champions. They're personal trainers who have them as a client. 
Mm. The closest that I have come to the Gordon Ryan method is uh, Saunders at yep. SWMA. Yep. Like that guy, I'm in his community and I strongly encourage everyone to join his community, uh, mm. White to Brown. It's it's so good. Shout out Joshy. <laughs> yeah, man. Like he's, uh, he's, he'll be at trials. Yeah, he is. He's uh, yeah. Sunday. And then he's um, got Subversion so coming up. Shout out to Subversion as well. Yeah, so. Subversion is going to be pumped. Bob, Bob versus Saunders is like just going to be amazing. Like you got to say Saunders is going to get it because he's like 20 kilos bigger. But <laughs> 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 he, he tries to emulate, not, you know, I know it's in his own thing. I'm not trying to, like I'm just, Giving him, giving you a compliment, Saunders. Don't bash me. Um, he <laughs> tries to emulate that professional Gordon Ryan method. Yep. Where everyone around him, like Luke, um, Luke Martin, um, is there to make Saunders a world champion. Yep. Now Luke has a bunch of other guys as well that are all like, they're at that stage. And I'm not disparaging them. I know they have to like work. They're at that stage, like the rest of the world, where they're invested in jujitsu to win trials. Mm but they haven't dedicated their life to being a professional athlete. Mm. And that's so I was going to open a gym. I actually had option last year, had invested everything to open a gym and I was fully like ready to bite the bullet. This year, it's 2023. Yeah? It's still yeah. this year, this year, this year, yeah, okay. um, earlier this year. But actually I told him I don't want to, because I don't want to open a gym. I want to be a professional sports coach in jujitsu. Mm. And I only want to do that. You know, like my journey in jujitsu has come, is been basically, I've come to the realization that jujitsu is probably the most amateur uh, professional sport in the world mm. um, and until a lot of the athletes coaches instructors gyms realize that they're out they are actually amateurs it'll never become professional yeah yeah so like my main thing like i said is i just want to coach people to win competitions and i have i have coached many people to competition success mm. because that's what i've done i've like sat with them going what do you want to do what's your training plan how often are you coming what, what are you doing right now? When is your next comp? Yeah, you're actually helping them to pull yeah, it together. Like, all right, cool. Your, your next comp is in three months. Stop doing this silly shit like working on your barambolos, man. Every single roll, straight to your A game, straight to what you're going to do. Mm. Um, making sure they're rolling with bigger people, making sure they're doing every single roll. Because like I love what Mario says, in competition, you don't get to go, I'm going to go have a good drink of water, man. Hold on. Yeah, periodized like, training. Yeah, it's just, yep. just, just go. And then, you know... When you finish, when's your next comp? Oh, your next comp's for si- not for six months. Let's work on something else. Let's do some skills acquisition. I noticed in the, like, so in the subversion trials, I've now watched it three times, mm-hmm. recent subversion trials. Three times I've watched it. What I noticed is a lot of those, the blue belts and purple belts that competed at subversion trials last week, they don't have good guard passing. Mm. I'm not saying they're bad at jiu-jitsu, man. A lot of those guys, like, I would struggle to pass their guard. Mm. But the simple thing was they were on, in guard and really good, and then they get to top. And they'd just be stuck there. Mm. And they'd win on like two points for a sweep. Yep. Now, if, if they had a coach, their coach would say to them, saw you had trouble passing guard, after subversion, because you're in subversion now, if for the people who made it to subversion, what we're going to concentrate for the ne- before your next competition is guard passing. Mm. Got to get your guard passing. The only thing you're allowed to do is guard pass. You get to guard, uh, that's cool. Let the pass go, submit, get recover, get back to top. All you're going to do is pass guard because mm. that's what your weakness is. The guys, so anyone who got knocked out from subversion, a bunch of you need to go work on your guard passing. That's what you should be doing for the next few months until the next subversion next year you want to try again because what will happen is if those same guys are still qualified for it and want to enter, if they work on their guard passing, they'll go to the subversion trials and just smash through guards mm. and submit and get to subversion. Yep. And that's like, that's um, like, this is the kind of stuff as well that I talked to Saunders about, right? So like I said, again, everyone should join his community. Absolutely amazing. I've tried every single one of those communities. Uh, I like um, Submeta. Uh, even Gracie Academy was pretty funny. Yep. Um, like you get good information on it. But the thing with Saunders community is I can ask him a specific question. He'll often call me a goose and say you're an idiot or a clown or whatever. <laughs> 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 but he will give me an answer. And he'll give me a customized answer with a video or with a very clear explanation. And then I can go implement that. And he knows I'm not a never going to be a world class athlete. Yep. But he's he's able to give me that instruction because of what he's learned from like John Denneher, like specifically John Denneher and Luke Martin. Mm. You know, he knows how to 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 coach like a professional coach. Articulate information. Yeah. Yeah. And he's yeah. also got a professional sporting background too. Exactly. Right. Yeah. When you when you're operating in like the highest levels of professional sport, you sort of uh, you can see all the things that we do, uh, or that is done in jiu-jitsu that can be seen to be very amateur. Yeah. You know, and like mixed martial arts was like that for, for the longest period of time. Yeah. You know, it's only like when you start to 
and uh, I get a lot of this out of um, Richie Walsh because he was coaching at the PI and he gets he had all the you know the facilities everything there that he could then leverage off to then try and improve his capacity um, as a guy that was you know uh, like a coaching a head coach and manager of, for a lot of these guys and you know he'll 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 often say look I don't have all the answers but I'll bring in the best people yes. to help my guys it's to get the best result it's the main thing like yeah. so often in jujitsu I, I like. I've talked to a lot of high-level people, talked to a lot of people who, who, who train and coach high-level competitors. So, and I, you know, deal with not high-level, but so often in jiu-jitsu, I'll find the answer. Like, in Reddit is the worst place to get answers. Oh, my <laughs> God, everyone is an expert. My main qu- answer on Reddit is you should do more half-guard. But um, uh, so often I'll see it'll be like, all right, I want to do competition. And then, the, like, an instructor or a purple belt or something will say, oh, what's your diet like? Mm. and then start telling the person about their diet, how to get their weight down. It's like, man, you've got that information from someone else, but you're not an expert. Mm. And if you were a legitimate coach, you would say, all right, let me check with the expert that I know and I'll, I'll, I'll check up on you. Like, I'll, I'll let you know what he says. Mm. You know, I can give you a basic guide. Like, oh, you're, you're three pounds overweight or five pounds overweight and you competition tomorrow. It's going to be something like, you know, water, protein, no carbs, that kind of thing. But let me just go check with somebody who actually knows what they're talking about fully mm. for your circumstance and we'll get you down to your weight. Mm. And it's the same thing with like um, even uh, te- techniques and game plan. it will be like, what's your game plan? And the people go like, I'm going to go for a single leg. Like I said, like fully walking through a sequence of moves mm. and they'll go, okay, cool. Let's work on your single leg. Whereas it should be, no, no, no. That's not, your, that's your sequence of moves, not a game plan. Yeah. Let's work on like your overall game plan. Because what happens if your single leg doesn't work? Yeah, that's right. You need an AB. Okay. Yeah. What are you going to do if that doesn't work? Like you get your single leg, get down, the guy won't let you pass the guard. What are you going to do? Yeah. If your tripod pass isn't going to work, what, what are you going to do? Yeah, what's part B? If you, and I've plan known, B, I should say. yeah, plan B. Like I've known so many people who get that. And then afterwards they'll come off the mat to me and they'll be like, oh, I couldn't get that tripod, tripod pass work. And I'm like, because you kept trying it. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. You, just, you didn't like pivot. Saunders always says, because you're spamming it. Some people ask, like, I'm having problems. I did it. I told him I'm having problems with my dog fight knee tap the other day. And mm. he went, because you're spamming it. And I was like, fully am spamming it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you you're, just chas- you're chasing that particular yeah. You've become fixated on that outcome. And so then he walked me through like, I know r- to change to a roll-through sweep. Yep. You know, if the dog fight's not working, change to a roll-through sweep. Something like that. I know that in my head. But just to get it reiterated by Saunders that I am spamming a move, even without him seeing it. I haven't mm. sent him a video. He just knows. Um, and it'll go through like, oh, yeah, I've got to go through my roll-through sweep. So next time I'm fighting... I'll hear in Saunders, he- I'll hear Saunders' voice in my head because you're spamming an ego. Yeah, and I'm like, ah, oh, sweet. That's why it's not working. Go through that roll through and get the sweep. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, I love jujitsu so much. I love. It so I always say to everybody, I hate jujitsu. I hate going to jujitsu. I hate everything about jujitsu. But it's just, just me being a smartass. I love jujitsu so much. It's it's fully like I'm absolutely one of those guys that's in the cult that will turn every conversation into a jujitsu conversation. I've watched hundreds of hours of instructionals. Mm. I, I am at the gym as much as I possibly can be. It's generally six days a week. Mm. Um, if I could go on Sundays, I would, but that's my chore and family day. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. know, like yeah. Sometimes my wife lets me go anyway. Yeah. I've trained at lots of different gyms, you know, like just visited. Um, and that's one of the other things I like to tell everyone. Like, actually, every gym is good. I, I've never been to a bad gym. Mm. I've been to lots of different gyms, like Melbourne, si- all around Sydney, um, C4 Gym in Coffs Harbour, like shout out to Chris and um, C4, they're awesome. Um, I went to, um, uh, what's his name, Frank Barker's 10th Planet in Melbourne. Mm. I've been to Absolute, I've trained at SWMA, like once I visited there, all these places. Mm. And actually, if for a drop-in, they're all the same. Mm. Okay, at every single gym I've been to, there's been some people I could beat up and some people who demolished me. Mm. When I went to SWMA, I had to fight Josh. Yeah. <laughs> What's that going to do? But the blue belt I did specific training with, passed his guard, submitted him. We, we swapped over. He couldn't pass my guard. I swept him. You know, like this is the thing. But then I had to fight Luke and Josh and they showed me I'm a baby. Yep. Um, so that, that's another thing about jujitsu that, that people need to realize. It's not about actually the gym. Mm. It's, it's never about the gym, man. It's well, it maybe there are some dodgy gyms, but it's never about the gym. It's about how you train and what you're training for. Mm. A lot of people will move gyms and just be like, I'm going to go to grappling education because they always win. But the guys that always win at grappling education are dedicated. They train heaps. They train with purpose. Yep. They consult and talk to guys who are like, you know, semi-professional, a step above that amateur, not fully professional. Mm. Like Keller, he's, Keller's got to run his gym. Yep. Guys are legends, so trains really well 
SWA with like they'll go like, I'm going to go to SWA with Ali and Lucas and mm. um you know they they two of the best people in Australia like I always tell people man if you got time go to SWA and uh, my BJJ West Side train during the day mm. go to their open mats you will never experience anything like it. it is absolutely phenomenal training but just leaving your gym and going there is not going to make you a professional athlete yeah training with you have to have that personal responsibility to yeah. actually want to be that one percent athlete exactly right if you everybody wants it but then they will you actually do the work to get there if is you the question go to swma and just attend classes yeah you're not going to be saunders no you're going to be like everybody else yeah yeah so if you want to be saunders act like saunders yeah you know dedicate your entire life to it train with purpose that guy always talks about like it's not about setting goals it's about training with purpose yeah. one of the greatest things he ever said to me is um like one of the ma- main questions I get asked as a coach is how can I be more aggressive? And I used to just say, you have to attack more. Mm. And then I was telling Saunders this and he said, that's a stupid thing. Like, <laughs> I love the way he talks. <laughs> it's a stupid thing to say. What you actually need to do is understand when it's a good time to attack and when it's a good time to af- defend. Yeah. So when I went back and watched more and read more and talked to Saunders more about like cycling through defense and offense. Yeah, offense offense cycles, 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 you know, cycles. like that's the, that's the thing. But when you go to an instructor as a jujitsu person, Go to your instructor at any gym. Go. How can I be more offensive? They, they are ninety-nine percent of them are going. How can I be more aggressive? They're going to say attack more. Mm. But it's the the one percent that are the coaches that want to turn you into the one percent. They'll say you don't want to be aggressive, man. Why are you being aggressive? Yeah. You want to know when to attack, know when to defend, move through your offensive and defensive cycles. Mm. And yeah, like that's that's jujitsu for me. Mm. I love it so much, but it frustrates the shit out of me because of the fact that people, everyone thinks they're a professional. I'm not a professional, mm. you know. But I can admit I'm not a professional. Mm. I, I work in tech and I do jujitsu part time. But you know there is a difference in in the way I approach it from a competition perspective, and yep. I, I've learned it from guys like Saunders and by watching Luke Martin. I used to be on the sidelines screaming at the people like, "Oh, you've got to sweep, sweep!" And then I watched um, Luke Martin coach from the corner from the sideline. Yeah, it's very stoic. Yeah, it's just it's just walking simple, through moves. simple instruction. Walking through moves. Yeah. Now some people need. Specific things like one guy that I always corner, all he needs is to know the points and the time, mm. right? That's all he needs. He doesn't need to me to walk him through instruction. He just needs to know the points and the time, and I he needs I need to be sure that he's heard it. Mm. So I'll be very vocal and yell the points and the time every thirty seconds. Mm. If he knows the points and the time, he progresses. Yep, he's got all in his head. He's game plan in his head. Yep. In one fight, only ever one fight, I have said to him, you need to go neon belly now to get points. Yeah. Because he was only up by an advantage um, and the guy looked like he was going to reverse. And all I was doing was telling this, this guy, like, to go neon belly to get points. Yeah. Because all he was doing was, that the guy bottom was basically spamming the reversal and then in that war of attrition, the guy on bottom was actually, I could see him. He's starting to come, yeah. Yeah. So I said, go neon belly to get points. Consolidate the points. And so he didn't get the points. Yeah. But he... Fixed his position by going to Neon Belly yep. and then won the match by one advantage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right. Cool. Now, last uh, last little topic. I always like talking about this. Um, and I'm curious about this because, you know, you, uh, your son Jordan. Yep. Um, so, y- you were in Sydney for a lot of that when he was growing up in Coffs or did he come down a lot or you went up a lot? Uh, How so did that work? Uh, he actually moved back to Coffs uh, with his mum just before his second birthday. So we were in Coffs for one year, uh, 19 months. Yeah. Then moved to Sydney and we broke up and then she moved back out just, just after his second birthday. Um, and then we went through like mad, crazy custody. It was bitter, okay. really bitter. So until he was around 10, it was like we had to go through mediations and lawyers and all that kind of stuff. So the way it would work is uh, one month I would fly up and pick him up yep. and fly straight back down. Yeah. And he'd be with us for three days. And then oh. I'd fly him back up and drop him off and come back down. Was that soul destroying? It was. Whole? It was so, so terrible. Yeah. Like, um, And the other month, bi-monthly, I have to go and stay in Coffs Harbour. Yeah. So sometimes I'd be like stay at friend's house from when I was in Coffs Harbour. Sometimes it'd be hotel room, stuff like that. That went on until he was old enough to fly by himself. Wow. Which is f- five or six years old. And um, he, he would fly down by himself? Yeah, so I would put him as an unaccompanied minor, pay an extra 30 bucks and they have a stewardess there for him. Um, and so he would come basically from that time most holidays for the whole school holidays. Um, but him and him, his mum and me were still like bitter at each other and we would do like terrible things to each other and talk shit about each other to him and stuff. It was terrible. I was not a good person at this stage. It was before I was with my wife. Like I said, she made me become an adult. Mm. I cannot stress enough how awesome Sandy is. Like my wife, she's, she's an amazing person. 
Um, and then when when he – so that would be it. He would come down during school holidays and stay for the whole school holidays. When he turned around nine or ten was when him and his him, his mum and me kind of sorted everything out and now we're quite – quite like she's kind of my friend actually, like we're friends. Yeah. Uh, Became amicable now. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, then he would just come for school holidays. Yeah, well. So it was until um, – Till he turned, so he started jujitsu on his sixteenth birthday, I believe, um, and he was really into it as well, like fully into it, like hardcore. He would go as much as possible. He, there's all these funny like Facebook memories that come up where he says things like, um, "Gi is for peasants. <laughs> the only competitions I will ever do are submission only, no time limits, no gi professionals, and stuff <laughs> like this." Because he's a kid, yeah. Um, but now he fully loves a gi. <laughs> so he. Um, is that when he turned 18, he actually stopped jujitsu for a while. Yeah. I think it was for eight months. And then he was visiting me once. And I was like, you don't do jujitsu, you know, let's go do jujitsu. So we went to Ricardo's house and, and did a private. I always remember this. Like Jordan said to him, um, Ricardo said, why would you stop jujitsu? And Jordan said to him, oh, I'm better now than I was when I stopped. And <laughs> Ricardo, if you know him, he has this look that he gets on his face <laughs> that says, you are the dumbest fucking idiot I've ever seen. Yeah. And he got that on the look at Jordan. And Jordan turned bright red and I just started laughing. So then Ricardo beat the shit out of Jordan for an hour. Um, and then when he went back and started jujitsu again. So when he, oh, I can't even remember what it was. So two years ago or something, he decided he wanted to take to become a professional. And he moved to Sydney to be able to train full time. Because mm. he couldn't in cost, there's limited classes. Yep. So what he would do is he would wake up in the morning, do weights. Uh, then he would go to SWA or my BJJ Westside and do open mats there. Then go and train at night at Camperdown, uh, my BJJ in a class. So basically he was doing rolling during the day and skills acquisition at night. Mm -hmm. um, but we went through COVID uh, and we didn't have the best relationship, to be honest. Like we both treated each other very poorly. Mm. Um, and so we've had a falling out now and we don't speak to each other at all. Oh, wow. Because um, it ended up like basically... Uh, he didn't like who I am and the way I am, and I didn't like who he is and the way he is. And then his mum says, because you're both the exact same, same, same person, yeah. you, and you both fucking hate yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, cool, man. So he moved out back to Coffs Harbour one year later, yeah. um, which was one and a half years ago. I haven't spoken to him since. Okay. Um, but I know like everybody updates me on him all the time. Yeah. Um, so he trains, I think it's five days a week now. Um, and he's won nationals and done some, gone, he's just got his purple belt and stuff. So yeah. as long as he's going well. It's like, so I talk to his mum all the time. Mm. Talk to her probably once or twice a week and get the updates on him. Um, I always said, like, his potential, he has the potential to be like the world champion. He's very, very good at jujitsu. His ability to retain information, like, just from watching it, you know, like you will watch an instruction and walk away and be able to basically recite the instructional back mm. to you. Um, it helps his jujitsu so much. One of the issues we had with his jujitsu when his coach training was like, oh, I was meant to be his head coach, but he was going to uh, um, my BJJ Westside and SW and getting a bunch of tips from them on how to train. Mm. And I, I had to, like, like I said, it was terrible to each other, but I didn't approach it properly because. I told him I wasn't going to help him anymore if he's just going to listen to them. Yeah. I wasn't saying he shouldn't listen to them. I was saying it's you can't be a professional if you have two different coaches, actually, mm. telling you two different things. But, like, I didn't say that. I just had, like, a bit of a, you know, jealous tantrum. Mm. Like, fuck, I'm not going to help you then if you're just going to go with them. Yeah. Um, and so it just it kind of stemmed from there, our, like, anger at each other. Um I, I love the guys at Westside, man. Like those, those end at SWA. Like those guys are full top tier level jujitsu guys. Yeah. They're all so nice. Like Ali, like I always say, Ali is the nicest guy I have ever met in my life. In fully moody. Yeah. <laughs> like, Lu Lucas is like such a legend. Ari, like Varun, all those guys are really cool guys. I hate the way Varun like um talks shit about my BJJ though. Like, come on, man. <laughs> 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 but like, um, yeah. So. Honestly, if he he's doing a lot better now than when he was here as well. Yeah. And I think it's because that because I was actually in the way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if he really really committed himself, like I had goals for him 
like that I tried to push onto him. Mm. And he says living vicariously through him or whatever, but it wasn't that. It was just like I wanted him to achieve what he wanted to achieve. Yeah. But yeah. I, um, I think I was tried to accelerate those goals. Yeah. And he wasn't comfortable with the acceleration as well. Like, you know, I wanted him to do when he just before he moved here, he did the ADCC Open at Kings, and mm. he got knocked out first round, intermediate. Just after he moved here, he did ADCC Open at Kings at a higher weight class mm. and won gold all submissions. Yeah. Um, and then, like, I wanted him to get onto the next subversion card, and he was, didn't feel that he was ready. But I like messaged George and was trying to get Jordan onto the next subversion card, and he ended up getting onto the next subversion card. Fought Matt Clark, who was the lighter champion, mm. and got submitted. Um, and then my goals for Jordan was like that I was getting like sponsorships and funding for and stuff was for him to go to Worlds that year later that year. Mm. But he 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 fully wasn't like. Down for that, like it wasn't. Yeah. But I was like really trying to force it onto him anyway. Like you can do it. I know you can. But yeah. If I don't know, like if it was lacking in confidence or belief or just understanding, he didn't think he could, so he didn't want to do it. And my me trying to force it onto him just caused more and more aggravation Ratchet between. It. Yeah. 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 It's it's hard because you know. Um, so Richie Walsh and I, we always talk about this. It's like sometimes when with an athlete, um, as a coach, you almost you got to you got to know when to get out of the way. Yeah. Right. Because uh, and I, and from talking to like a lot of the guys who coach MMA, like even Luke Pizzuti said this, you know, um, the ones that are special, they're always going to be special, right? <laughs> and, and and the way that Richie and I put it, it's like, well, R- Richie will say this to me. It's like sometimes you just got to not fuck them up, like you yeah, know, yeah, you like you got to you, you got to not derail, like not to say derail them, but you got to you got to know when to get out of their way and um, let them find their own feet because, as you know, it's like people have got to make their own mistakes. Yeah, you know, definitely. You, you, you're the same. You know, you talk. You, we, we're going through your whole life, and we talk about that. And it's like you know, you you realize a lot of things when you have to do it yourself. Yeah, right. And I, I'm sure you know, um, he's probably got a lot of your personality in that sense, and that's yeah. why you two are clashing because he's like, get out of the fucking way, dad. Like, I always <laughs> think I always tell him like, and I tell everyone like, I can predict predict everything he's gonna do next. Yeah, and it's just. Then and like pi- you know that would piss him off more. Oh yeah, it does. Yeah, it because it would just be like you, right? Yeah. Like that would piss and you his off. His mum would say it's because um, he's exactly like you, and that's what you would do. And also, he he doesn't like it when you say that, so stop saying it. Yeah. But then I'd say it anyway, just to annoy him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like, like I said, I, I like it's the wor- basically the worst thing. You know, like I, said, I used to break into places and do. I used to be a drug dealer for a while as well. You know. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh okay. We need to talk about this story. What, what, what were you? What, what, what were you doing? What were you selling? I was just selling pot. Like okay. uh, when I was like uh, eighteen, you know, I was like. Uh, my my mate bought an ounce, yeah, um, and then I sold it for him. And then he bought another ounce. I sold it for him. It was like you know an ounce a week kind of pot sales. When yeah. I was like sixteen, seventeen. It was when I was uh, in uh, living in Bellevue Hill. Yeah, um, it was just for money. Like I got thirty bucks for every ounce I sold. Yeah, and he took the rest of the profit. You okay. know? So yeah, it was. <laughs> but you know, I've done terrible things. Like yeah. not fully terrible. Like I haven't murdered anyone or anything. But done terrible things. But I kind of feel like my. Uh, Treatment of Jordan has always been like the worst thing I've done, mm. uh, because all I, all I really needed to do was like listen to him about what he actually wanted to do instead of trying to force. Because you know I'm I was like I'm older, therefore I have more knowledge, therefore I know more, mm. therefore I'm more correct. Yeah, but that's actually not how life works, man. Yeah, like I have I have these hilarious conversations with my nine year old, my eight year old now, she's eight yeah eight, where I I and I've learned from this like experience with Jordan, like I have to concede defeat even for a nine year old. Yeah. Like yeah. they, I got, I they're a, right, they're right. I got, I got a two-year-old, you know, about to turn three, and like uh, once they start talking back, <laughs> she, she, it's always her way or the highway. And my, and my wife is like, stop, stop encouraging her, you know. And it's like, well, she's gonna be stubborn no matter what. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's probably a bit of my personality in there, right? And you know, it's about how do you sort of work around that to get the best out of them without, you know butting heads with them too yeah, much. Yeah, exactly. So my, my two other kids do jujitsu now as well. It's been about a year, I think. And my son, Alex, honestly, he is the best in the family at jujitsu. Yeah. Um, he's only nine years old. Yeah. But he's, like, he's, he's got a never-say-die attitude. Mm. Um, you know, you go through, like, I have this, like, this white belt, um, uh, white belt belief, like, when a guard is almost passed, a white belt will give up and let the guard be passed. Mm. Whereas Alex is only nine, he refuses. Yeah, he keeps fighting. Yeah, forever. Um, He's really technical, like just naturally. He even before he did jujitsu, he'd bring his feet in and take guard. Uh, he started to pull guard, which frustrates the crap out of him. I'm like, do wrestling because it's more fun. Um, he's always chasing the back. He's done two comps and one gold in both. Never lost a comp fight. Um, I don't want him to compete outside with his intercomps, but you know, he only trains once a week. Mm. 
And so we had this whole thing with him where he didn't want to do jujitsu anymore because he said it was useless. And I was like, "Have you already been watching Andrew Tate?" Um, uh, <laughs> had he? No. <laughs> <laughs> but what what it was was he has a cousin who's two three years younger than him, and his cousin has a higher belt than him. Oh, okay. Uh, like they both grand white belts, and then Kai, his cousin, got a stripe, and Alex didn't have a stripe, so Kai, Alex didn't want to go anymore. Just, uh, yeah, upset him. Yeah. And I was like, just go. And he was adamant he wouldn't. And I, like, like I said, I learned. I was like, I'm not going to have this argument. Like, I'm not going to try and force him to do something he doesn't want to do. So I said, like, okay, man, like, the thing is, you, Charlotte, your sister's got to go to Acro in the morning, and I've got to teach on Saturday nights, and Charlotte still wants to do jujitsu. So what we'll do is, like, your mum's going to take Charlotte to jiu to Acro. You're going to come with me to jujitsu, and then I'll I t- help with the kids. Um, but my brother teaches the kids, and I help. Charlotte's going to do jujitsu, and mum will take you home. Mm. But my wife was like, you know, I've got to give it to her. It was like, actually, like, good. Um, she was like, no, he has to do it, actually, because he doesn't have any other activities. Mm. So he has to have an activity. So she said to him, you have these choices, right? You can, um, if you're not going to do jujitsu, you have to come for a walk with me. So she comes to the gym, drops off the kids, and goes for an hour or two walk, depending mm. how many classes they're going to do. Yeah. And so if you're not going to do jujitsu, you come for the walk. You went for one walk, came back, and went, oh, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> then she jiu-jitsu. said, like, no, then she's, he was like, I still don't want to do jujitsu then. She's like, okay, then you have to come shopping with me. Okay. Okay. He went shopping once, said, I don't want to do that. And I was just, okay. And he said, can I just sit here and do nothing? And she said, yeah, you can sit there and do nothing. That's your option. So if you don't want to do an activity, you can sit there. If it's going to be one or no two screens. hours, no screens, nothing, stare blankly into space. After the first day of that, he was like, I'll do jujitsu. Yeah. And he, like, he fully loves it. But then, like, this is where I found out it was all about stripe, right? He said to me, if I go back to jujitsu, am I going to get a stripe? And I said, man, you were one week away from getting a stripe. Yeah. All you had to do was go. Now you delayed it. you had it. to have a freaking tantrum about Kai. And now, you know what? Kai goes every week, so he's three weeks ahead of you now. Yeah. So he's going to get a stripe earlier than you, second stripe. Yeah. You have to live with it because now you know you'll catch up. And I was like, all right, I understand now, I'll catch up. Yeah. But he's like so good at jujitsu, and And, and like, I don't want to make the same mistakes I did with Jordan. I don't push him onto anything. The only thing I don't want him to do is external competitions because I hate external kids' competitions. Mm. I hate the way parents and coaches behave with kids. Yep. And I ref at them um, at some of the comps, and I just don't like the way they are. Like Luke. Luke is the same with his kids as he is with his adults, mm. except he doesn't call them an idiot. Um, <laughs> but I, I hate those parents and coaches that are on the corner corners of their kids, their nine, ten-year-old kids. Mm. That like just screaming at them, it really like I just want to go over and go like, come on, man, like, calm down. It's fucking nine. Like, yeah, it's not the world championships. It doesn't yeah, matter. Right. This is right. this is meaningless. Let them find their own way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know the SWA guys are really funny. Like their kids are all killers. Mm. I, I told um, Ali and Adele last time they're turning him. These all these they're churning out clones of Lucas Kainard. Mm. They they run in. They pull DLR. They go for, for <laughs> sweets and <laughs> Baron Bolos and stuff like that. And they're really strongly encouraged to just keep fighting. Mm. But, uh, like, when they're cornering him, like, Lucas and stuff are cornering him, they're not crazy. They just tell them, like, you know, you've got to get sweep. you got to, like, they're, they're a little bit more animated than someone like Luke. Mm. But they're not those ones that are, like, screaming, screaming at their kids. Just kill him. Yeah, exactly. Just break his arm. And I'm like, that's the happy <laughs> medium that I would, I would be happy with. But I don't want to expose my kids to that, mm. even if it's not me or, or their side, their coaches doing it. Yep. I just don't want them to see other kids getting screamed at like that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't let him do co- – he asks, can I do competition? I'm like, no, nah, man. Wait until you're like 16. Yeah. There's nothing 14. wrong holding him back like that. If anything, that might that might feed the fire a little bit. But at some time, you know, if he's really, really pushing to do it, you know, you might have to just let him try and yeah. learn, right? Like it's the thing. Well, that's it. Like he's turning 10 in February. The way I figure it is like that 12 to 14 period – is, is when I'll, like, introduce him to external competitions. Yeah. Um, I, I won't corner him. Uh, I used to corner Jordan all the time, um, but I won't corner him. I didn't corner him in his intercomps. I'll get, like, one of his other teachers to corner him because, man, when, I, when I'm when i cornering someone, I get super nervous. It's way worse. When I'm competing, it's, it's nothing. Like, honestly, I could yep. not care less. But when I'm cornering someone, I'm super nervous for them, mm. and it's way worse for my kids. Yeah. Like way worse. Like at least you, at least you can recognize that now. So. Yeah. So I'm just I won't corner him or anything like that, and I just let him run his own game and do whatever he wants. You know, yeah. that's that's the way I think it's better. I know there are some really successful father son duos, like yeah. um Zach, um, from Angel MMA. Yeah. His dad is his coach. And yeah. Zach is like a fucking killer, <laughs> like scary. I was telling him he needs to use more half guard. Um, 
but you know that's really successful because they have a good dynamic. Yeah, like yeah, me, me and Jordan didn't have the best dynamic, so it was never going to be successful. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we better wrap it up. We've gone over time, but uh, oh, sweet. You, <laughs> might, you, you, you should shout out, you know, all your companies. So let's go. What? What? Let's go through the laundry list here. <laughs> so there's DigiGround, um, which is an application development and marketing agency. We also do social media growth, and if you give us uh, contact me and mention Subversion because we're a Subversion sponsor, get twenty percent off a year versus a year of Instagram growth. Okay. Um, and so yeah, get, as I said, we're a sponsor for Subversion. Uh, there's SmartBee, which is a sports ecosystem providing all of your news and information on every sport that we can possibly think of. We also run competitions on there. So there's a competition right now. If you sign up and mention Subversion, you win two tickets to the first event for next year. Nice. Uh, you can also, I think, if you pick NRL, I can't remember everything, NRL basketball or cricket, you can win a corporate box for you and 17 mates Ooh. at a fixture of your choice next That's year. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's Auction, it's O-K-T-I-O-N, mm -hmm. which is an event management platform for fundraising. Uh, for charities and stuff. You can sell tickets there. You can organise any events. I do have an event running there right now that I've had to put on hold. Um, it's beat up the half half guard prints for charity. I got injured. What I'm looking for is people to volunteer to beat me up on camera for 10 minutes or roll with me for on camera for 10 minutes and just generate in money for to prevent child trafficking. Yep. Um, so just contact me if you want to beat me up for 10 minutes. Um, I'll come to your gym and you can beat me up afterwards if we live stream it. Okay. Um, and then there's Puppy Lovers, P-U-P-P-I Lovers, which is a dating app for dog lovers and dog owners. Only, um, only dogs? What only about if they're cat owners? Yeah, this is everybody asks that. Yeah. And it's like they all want the they all want the pussy lovers out there. <laughs> 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 but um, one guy also asked, "Can you make snake lovers?" And I, I fully, it took me a while to get it. Like, yeah. can, can you make snake lovers? Make yeah. snake lovers. Make <laughs> snake, what, what you got? Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'll at the moment it's just one. dogs. Uh, in the future, we are actually planning to expand that into other pets. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's that one's just relaunching now. Um, if you are single and you own or love dogs. There'll be a massive speed dating event just before Valentine's Valentine's Day next year uh, for puppy lovers. There you go. So check us out on social and add me at the Half Guard Prince. Um, I'm happy to get into internet troll arguments. I love it. It's fun. All right. <laughs> cool. cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. See you guys. <laughs> See ya.